what we are saying. It's looking at all sides of this, Trish, not just the differences between the performance of a trans woman and a woman in sport, but with a sympathetic look as to how and why people must understand, really, that in uh, high-end sport and school sport now, it's mm. not fair as far as all the scientists and scientific okay. instrumentation go. All right. Well, good luck with good luck with the show. Uh, I will see you here next Saturday. Until then, have a great week. This is Talk TV. Want to get to grips with the stories that really matter? To cut through the spin and the BS. Want unvarnished and fiery debate? Then join us for Crosstalk. One o'clock every weekday. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. The British fish industry has been hit by a perfect storm of problems. First, the pandemic, then Brexit, and now the economic recession. A woman can become a man, and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. David Cameron needs to worry about his own country, and frankly, he can kiss my ass. Yes. Boom, fantastic. We need a bit more of that in the UK. I can't wait to hear Liz Truss say something like that. Well, she's she's saying what a lot of people think. Not if you can't then... call Hamas terrorists, I can't talk to you. Cut the interview. Fine. Goodbye. Thank you, Chris Williamson. There is something to be said, though, about types of breed, that if they do no. turn, then no. you can be no. in trouble. I've got a cockapoo. No. If that cockapoo turns on me, I win the battle. I don't see any sign of forgiveness from the other members of the family for the terrible lies and disloyalty which he's shown. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of the street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. King Charles has been diagnosed with cancer. The palace released a new picture of King Charles showing His Royal Highness smiling and buoyant despite the shock news. Our only way out of the theater was through the stage. Right. Uh, so we actually had to, to pass right next to him, right in front of him. Mm -hmm. And at that point, he tried to get the entire crowd to chant with him, cease fire now and free Palestine. Right. But you managed to get out and you must have been shocked. If we had lingered for over a minute, right. I think it would have come to physical violence. It's not like, you know, they live in an average semi and where's Harry going to sleep? You might have thought he's come all the way. Couldn't he at least have spent a couple of days with them at Sandringham just, you know, to use the vernacular, chilling out a bit? You've been having to fight again for compensation after having to fight to be believed, then fight to get your conviction quashed, to get what's rightfully yours. If Archetypes was as successful as they claim, why is Spotify that paid Harry and Meghan a significant amount of money to produce 13 episodes? episodes in total, including the Christmas special, willing to hand that over to Limonada to do whatever they want with it. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. It may be that it's a more serious problem at the BBC than just her. I'm problem. giving her some objectivity because I think you've got to look at someone. What are you well, going okay. up for? This is the plank of the week, Michael. Will. <laughs> bloody therapy session. <laughs> The problem is, Liz Truss is the most unpopular <laughs> Prime Minister exactly. that we've ever had, and so yeah. they would have been better off calling it UnpopCon. <laughs> um, Nobody is, is spending any money. They're not prepared to do it. I mean, why is that? Uh, quite simple. The downturn in the spend is three simple words, financial fair play. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? Ed Balls and, and George Osborne were asked you know, on their podcast last uh, a week or so ago, would you tell your kids to go into politics? And they both said no, right. because it's so nasty now, it's scary. I wouldn't, I wouldn't think they would be safe. Do not come <laughs> to the UK. All you will get is free accommodation, warmth, <laughs> food, 40 quid a week, education, health service. It's just not worth it. <laughs> That's it. I think you're being unnecessarily provocative. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
My new primetime show on talk TV and radio, 7 o'clock Saturday night, James Whale Unleash. I don't need you coming in here, following me around with a car. I'm so sorry about this. Saturdays at 7 on talk TV. And a very good evening to you. Welcome to the Sunday Night Club. One of the highlights for me tonight will be talking in the last hour to West Bromwich Albion and to talk about the real possibility now of confirmation in the next few days that their club has been taken over, that all of the work that Action for Albion and others have done has paid off. And it's um, just great to have been a very small part of that here on the Sunday Night Club. That's coming up in the third hour today, along with Baz Ball, that didn't really work in the third test against India, but Angus Fraser and Neil Burns will be with me. And we'll also be talking a, a touch of golf in the last hour as well. Tiger Woods, is it time for him to call it a day amongst many other things? And at the Phoenix Open, had the party just gone a little too far? Keith Hackett, Mark Halsey, both our refs, of course, with us in this first hour and lots to talk about to them. And we're going to feature the two games today. Um, first of all, Luton Town against Manchester United. A terrific game. All the first goals scored in the first 14 minutes. Two for Manchester United in the first minute and seventh minute from Highland. And uh, Morris on 14 for Luton, but there was no way... Uh, that they could get an equaliser, however hard they tried. And for Sheffield United, it's been dismal again. They were thrashed 5-0 at home by Brighton. So we'll talk, uh, talk about those games in details and with the referees as well. It's been a good weekend, though, hasn't it, for Liverpool, who've got four away from home to win, and for Arsenal, who got five, Wolves, who won at Spurs. And somehow Manchester United are creeping ever closer with 44 points to 47 to 49. I don't think they're going to reach the top two by any means. But it will be interesting with still some important games to come. Let's start then with that Manchester United game t this afternoon. I thought at times uh, Luton Town were going to get back into it. They had all sorts of opportunities without completely threatening the Manchester United goal, particularly in the second half. Darren Jones, of course, the Luton Town Stadium announcer is with us. Hi, Darren. Hi there, Mark. How are you doing? You OK? Yeah, very well indeed. And Joe Smith, of course, from the Stratford Paddock Fan Channel. Uh, good evening to you as well, Joe. Hello. How are you doing? You OK? Yeah, very, very well indeed. I mean, just for Manchester United and, and you, Joe, first of all, I mean, a, a sigh of relief in the end there. Two up after yeah. seven minutes. Here we go. But it could have been a similar story to Maidstone at one stage. Yeah, I don't know what... United's inability to sort of push on from good positions has been something that sort of characterised the whole season. We saw it a few times in the Champions League. We saw it against Wolves a couple of weeks ago. And I know, we, you know, we scraped over the line. I say we scraped. It was a brilliant goal from Cobby Mainu on that occasion that got us over the line. But this, we, we, we get to this point where... We play really well, and then we get in in the lead, and then we go, right, that's us done now. You know, we'll let you do what you want from here. We let the opposition impart their style of play, their will. And I say let, that's maybe slightly dis disrespectful to Luton, who I thought were e excellent. They pressed really well. Every time our defenders had the ball, our midfielders had the ball, there were two and three men around them. They played very, very well. But we saw, and, you know, just looking at the, the position of the two teams in the league, United have and should have the ability to control games like this. And whether it's Luton... Just losing a little bit there um, of Joe at the moment. We'll come back to you, uh, Joe, in a minute. Darren, um, I think it's going to be the atmosphere around the country at times as well tonight. There's, there's all sorts of bits and pieces uh, out there. But uh, Darren, really, I mean, apart from that first 14 minutes, you had opportunities. Yeah, you know what? I think that we, we're really changing the narrative on Luton Town Football Club. I think we have done the whole season. But today, it really does prove that, you know, we're not there to make up the numbers. You know, if I'm being honest, I, I've actually left there gutted today. I'm gutted that the little old Luton Town, as everyone refers to us as, as, as literally, you know, we should have beaten Man United today. We were so unlucky. Um, and it just goes to show exactly what we're doing and, and how well we're going. So, fingers crossed, we can carry on playing the way we are. 
and um, and we'll get them more points, and we'll be uh, we'll be on the on the show next year as a Premier League team, Mark. Well, you've uh, rejuvenated uh, some of the stars from uh, Premier League gone by, haven't you? Yeah, like Ross Barkley and Andros Townsend have been like absolutely brilliant since they've come in. Um, but obviously, Barkley has been unbelievable. Like, you know, I know Luton supporters in their 70s and their 80s and they're all saying the same thing. He's got to be one of the most technically technically gifted players to ever wear a Luton shirt. He really is amazing. And um, he, he, he makes our team tick at the moment. So hopefully he'll carry on. We'll keep him injury free and, um, and he'll be firing us up the table. Uh, for Manchester United, Joe, and it's uh, good to have you back and uh, running on all systems here. Uh, I mean, yep, you've still got three points away from home. Uh, that's what it's about, getting it done. You did have late on or, or certainly midway through the second half, three or four one-on-ones. And, and the, and the yeah. thing uh, wouldn't worry me because I'm not a Manchester United fan, but it would mar- worry Manchester United fans. Uh, one-on-ones there, you either took a, a, more of a touch or, or looked at the wrong decision of which way to go, which... The great Manchester United side used to finish with those and Van Nistelrooy and others all the time. Yeah, well, this isn't a great United side, is it? And, no, it's not. No. You know, much like United, then just as just as things were going well, uh, I cut out, which is sort of very similar to how United have been this season. And we obviously we've got a lot of young players. I think you look at some of the people. You know, Garnacho was one who was through one on one, and I think he's we're seeing a, a much improved version of him and one that continues to improve over on the right-hand side. Bruno Fernandes, I thought, had a poor game today, but people, I think, are too quick to jump on a Bruno Fernandes, who's been fantastic for United over the last four or five years. Um, but it is odd that, you know, as, as, as uh, you were just saying before, we get these chances and we almost the hard ones and, and easy mm. ones at the moment. And, it's frustrating to watch as a, as a fan, but feeling more disappointment than I did happiness because of how the game got, even though we've won. Because what, what that means, of course, is that you can't relax. And uh, I know that, you know, the great Manchester United sides all the way down the, the, the decades have always got it done with flair and style at times. Uh, and, of course, got it done in the last moments of important matches like that Champions League final and and many other things. Um, but there is certainly a lot of work to be done to get these players feeling the confidence rather than the pressure, I think, of playing for Manchester United at the moment. Yeah, I do think that we're currently on our best run of form all season. I think we've won six of our last seven, undefeated in those seven as well, um, which is the sort of run we've not seen all season. So that's good. That's a positive. But confidence, I think people, especially in the sort of modern era, are so obsessed with stats and play styles and management and this. And people forget that nothing makes a bigger difference to how players perform and how teams do than confidence. Look at Liverpool last season. They looked, you know, far worse than Man United. They were terrible. And, you know, they've made a few signings and this, that and the other. But now look at them. They're they're top of the league. And most of that is confidence. Klopp wasn't a bad manager. He wasn't telling them bad tactics or not to put the ball in the back of the net. Yeah, I mean, it, you find as well, don't you? That Confidence is it, huge, and it's United confi- have yeah. not just got. Sorry, we're um, we, we, we're still. That was an interesting point that Joe was uh, going to make there. Darren, I'll come to you as well. Um, you, you, Luton Town's still very much in at the moment. This Premier League, perhaps they've surprised people, but they deserve to be there. And and one of my great friends in in the game and the wise old Al. It was lovely to see David Pleat there. Uh, he'll know that they're not going uh, anywhere without a fight. And you've got still the opportunity, I think now, with some real uh, experienced heads in the dressing room. Yeah, like, you, you know, we're, we're playing... I think we've got to put it out there. We're playing some really good football. I think we proved that today. Um, the football's going well. And we've got... A, I think we've got a great mix of, of young and experienced players. When you look at the likes of... Um, Mengi, who we brought in actually from Man United, we've then got Yuchongs. So we've got all of these young guys, but then them experienced head are just adding to that. But they've got so much energy and so much desire. And um, yeah, 110%, like like in the David Pete days, we, we will not be going down without a fight. And um, I can now say that uh, my friend that's actually sitting with me just recently said, he goes, we've played all the big teams at home now. Yeah. So now we've got the rest of them. So now this is the time where we can uh, really fight and, and proper go for it. But you know, we're doing well and that's all we can carry on doing. And if we carry on playing the way we are, 100% we can stay up.
Yeah, I think that uh, you've got every chance. I mean, it depends at the moment what else is going to happen down the bottom there, doesn't it, with uh, the likes of Everton. Uh, but Burnley and Sheffield United below you. Sheffield United have got an awful lot of work to do. Yeah, to be fair, I think I think Sheffield United, like, and I, I don't want to be disrespectful to them, but I do think that's that sort of, I think maybe that's done now. You know, they've had a 5-0 a defeat today. Um, it's not looking good for them. You know, Burnley, they could turn it around, but I think out of all the three teams that have gone up, we're, we're the team to keep an eye on for, you know, mm. potentially staying up and uh, settling down in the Premier League. So, Joe, here's the uh, thing about Manchester United. You've got Ineos and everybody's saying, you know, they're taking over all the football side of things. They're, they don't own the whole club by any means, so it's not all. So the final decision is still going to rest on uh, certain monies and what have you. Eye-watering uh, transfers still there have been and, uh, and wages and everything. But they need to get it right now, don't they? And they need mm. to get it right in two ways for me. One, you have, and I know it's been talked about in the last two or three uh, weeks, you know, those growing uh, into the Manchester United first team understand when they've come through, um, through the academy and some who've made it all the way, they understand. They understand the responsibility. Some of the others who've come in from outside just think, you know, I'm in a side and I look around here that others can do it for me. And those are the two mm. things I think that Manchester United have got to sort out if they're to challenge again, not just in the Premier League, but, but I firmly believe in, in the European leagues. Yeah, I agree. And I, I, However, I do think that, you know, you look at some of the great sort of mentality players in the history of Man United and they didn't come through the academy. The likes of Roy Keane and Rio Ferdinand and Manu Vidic, um, you know, plenty of players just... Eric Cantona, maybe the best example of that of anyone. They were outside players who came from different countries, different clubs, different rivalries. Even look at uh, Ferdinand played for Leeds, and that didn't affect things. If anything, these are some of the great sort of mentality players in the history of Man United. So I think that it's a person by person thing rather than a did you come through the yeah. academy, did you come from from wherever else. Um, but I do think there's definitely reason to be optimistic as a United fan at the moment, and Ineos are doing things that. The Glazers haven't done in nearly 20 years, getting a, a, a solid structure of people who have done the job at a good level to help the manager out from, you know, CEO all the way down to the manager. Every person in that chain needs to be good at their job. And in the past, you know, the Glazers have just been hiring the, the person who's nearby or their mate or whatever. And it's obviously not going to work. And, you know, some of it feels a bit basic and a bit easy. But you think, well, that just goes to show just how little and just how poor the decision-making that the Glazers, has, the Glazers had been doing uh, for the last 18 years has been. Because, you know, some of this stuff is, I would be able to do this. I would be able to look at Dan Ashworth or, you know, Omar Brada at Man City and say, look how well they've done, let's get them in. Mm. And yet the Glazers had done none of that. It's embarrassing. Yeah, no, I understand that completely. Do you think as well that there is uh, the will of the Glazers to take a complete back seat now mm. and, and, and financially no I, I think they want to stay there they want to be able to sort of have this as an investment i think they would see man united as a stock that they've invested in i don't think they see it as a business that they own and certainly a business that they run they see their shares in man united as a way to make uh, money as the club of the the value of the club increases so does their portfolio whereas ratcliffe and ineos they are managing manchester united not as a manager but as the managers of the club they're getting the right people in they're mm. looking at man united as a as a as a football club and as a business the glazers literally just go all right what's the stock price what's the current value that's good you know that's what we're worth i think that's literally all they see it as and that difference and that shift with the momentum that united can achieve being such a big club i think over the next few years we'll really start to see a snowball effect and hopefully like you said the united can challenge not just in the premier league but back in europe again as they as they should be and, and where we are, we're coming to the uh, nitty-gritty now, aren't we, as far as uh, the rest of the season for Luton Town. And, Darren, are you happy that, um, it, that there's been no nonsense about any of this? Everybody seems to understand what you want to do. They're all playing to the basically to the top of their ability at the moment. A lot of them, I mean, Barclay, from when he first came to the club, just looks, he looks 10 years younger to start with, to be honest with you. Um, and he looks fit and he looks lean and he knows what he's doing because his, his brain is sharp again and he wants to do it and he's got a bit of love from Luton. And then those around him, uh, 
are continuing to do exactly the same. And I've, I've actually, I, I, I've not liked some of the stuff that have been in a lot of the papers about Luton Town, as if, you know, everybody's sort of doing you a favour that you're still not in the bottom three and the, uh, and all this sort of stuff. I mean, it, for, for me, I think that this is this is a side of our game that we we need to stamp out a little bit more. Yeah, 110. percent You know, the, the story of Luton Town is most probably one of the best football stories you can you can get from being absolutely taken down all the way out of the, all throughout the leagues and then getting all the way back up there. And um, you know, we deserve to be in the Premier League. I think today, being on Super Sunday, and I'm sure a lot of people around the country have kind of seen that we took Man United. We took Man United on today, and we, we deserve to be in the Premier League, and we're good enough to be in the Premier League. And I've, I hope that we're going to stay there. And um, I'm, I'm sure sort of um, the Man United guy that over there right now, I'm, I'm sure he's going to have looked at that game and gone, you know, these guys aren't pushovers. You know, what Rob Edwards, what 2020, Gary Sweet, what everyone has done for this club is is incredible. And um, I don't care about points deductions or anything like that. You know, at the end of the day, if we stay up, we're going to stay up on, on the merit of that we're good enough to be there. And um, I can really see it happen. Aston Villa and Spurs... Um, have been up and down a little bit. Is there still realism and hope at Manchester United that top four is not out of the question? Yeah, we're only five points off. You can't, you know, you'd be foolish to roll us out. The only problem is at Villa are having a, a bad time. We're having a really good time and we still haven't caught them. So when those forms twist and go back the other way, if we're not within touching distance of them, they'll pull away again and I think we'll see a, a tricky end of the season. But United look much better and it coincides with people coming back from injury. So for me, that's a good indicator that this can be a consistent return to form rather than just a flash in the pan. Joe Smith and Darren Jones, thank you both very much indeed. Great start to the show talking about uh, Luton and Manchester United. Terrific game that one was today. Uh, Sheffield United, they had a goal ruled out at offside when they were two down. Would it have made any difference? I'm not so sure because uh, the Albion Roar, which is A.D. Packham's business. Uh, he's up next with James Shield. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. The British fish industry has been hit by a perfect storm of problems. First, the pandemic, then Brexit, and now the economic recession. A woman can become a man, and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. David Cameron needs to worry about his own country, and frankly, he can kiss my ass. If boom, fantastic. We need a bit more of that in the UK. Well, she's she's saying what a lot of people think. Not if you can't then... call Hamas terrorists, I can't talk to you. Cut the interview. There is something to be said, though, about types of breed, that if they do no. turn, then no. you can be no. in trouble. I've got a cockapoo. Yeah. If that cockapoo turns on me, I win the battle. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. Our only way out of the theater was through the stage. Right. Uh, so we actually had to pass right next to him, right in front of him. Mm -hmm. And at that point, he tried to get the entire crowd to chant with him, ceasefire now and free Palestine. Right. But you managed to get out, and you must have been shocked. If we had lingered for over a minute, right. I think it would have come to physical violence. You've been having to fight again for compensation after having to fight to be believed, then fight to get your conviction quashed, to get what's rightfully yours. If Archetypes was as successful as they claim, why is Spotify willing to hand that over to Limonada to do whatever they want with it? What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> It may be that it's a more serious problem at the BBC than just her. I'm problem. giving her some objectivity because I think you've got to look at someone. Why are you well, doing okay. that for? This is the plank of the week, Michael. Will. <laughs> bloody therapy session. <laughs> Nobody is, is spending any money. They're not prepared to do it. I mean, why is that? Uh, quite simple. The downturn in the spend is three simple words, financial fair play. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? 
Ed Balls and, and George Osborne were asked, would you tell your kids to go into politics? And they both said no, no. because it's so nasty now. It's scary. I wouldn't, I wouldn't think they would be safe. Do not come <laughs> to the UK. All you will get is free accommodation, warmth, <laughs> food, education, yeah. health service. It's just not worth it. <laughs> That's it. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Time to talk now about Sheffield United, beaten uh, again today, this time at home by uh, Brighton and Hove Albion. And 5-0 uh, the score. They uh, had a man sent off in Mason Holgate in the first uh, 10 minutes. It was 12, 12 minutes, I think, exactly. But uh, you can't have that. It was a horrific challenge. And from there, you're really struggling. Let's talk to both sides on this one for Brighton, uh, A.D. Packham is with us from Albion Raw and James Shield is with us, the Sheffield United reporter as well. James, um, a very good evening to you. Good evening, Mark. It's difficult, this. Um, for all fans, we know at times uh, you've got games where we possibly we're at home, we've got to somehow get something out of this. And, and for what Holgate did early on, I mean, there's just no excuse for that. No, Chris Ward will be absolutely fuming after that game. It was interesting. I was at his press conference as well on uh, on Friday, and one of the things that he was really keen to hammer on, one of the messages that he, he clearly wanted to get across was the importance of discipline, uh, not only mentally, but tactically as well. He's spoken about how Brighton keep the ball. The possession percentage and the way that they recycle it is obviously phenomenal. Uh, so to see one of his new players but senior players one of his most experienced players in that squad in terms of premier league games on his uh, on his cv uh go into a tackle like that so early in the game obviously rex sheffield united's game plan chris wild although he probably won't say it publicly uh i think there'll have been a few words in that dressing room because it absolutely wrecked the uh, the entire game plan that they will have been working on all week. Yeah, exactly that. You you, you can't have uh, anything like that happen in the way it did. Just to before we talk Brighton as well, did you feel that you could have got back into that? Um, well, you could have done it at one stage, but the goal uh, offside. That, when things don't go your, your way, they don't go your way, and and it was offside. Yeah, that that that's right. I I think one of the one of the important things is obviously Sheffield United now and one of these games was to Brighton in the FA Cup have conceded five in their last uh, their last three home games, which I mean clearly that that tells its own story. You don't need to have a UA for pro license to be able to unravel the mass behind that. It's clearly not good enough. But I think as strange as this might sound, there has been an improvement in Sheffield United under Chris. They have battle. They have been in games more. The Aston Villa game, obviously, let's 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 park that one. But they have been in games an awful lot more. The FA Cup tie against Brighton and Albion, I don't think it was really a, a five uh, or a five-two game. Brighton deserved to win the game. There's no doubt about that. But you saw it again today. The one thing that is absolutely holding Sheffield United below the waterline in this division, and that is just individual errors, individual mistakes, be it either from Mason Holgate, but then also having been reduced to 10 men, the first two goals they conceded, wholly preventable as well. You know, one of those coming from a set piece. There's no excuse, even when you're at a numerical disadvantage, to be conceding goals like that. This division was always going to be hard enough for, or, you know, for a Sheffield United squad that I think many of us who watch it on a regular basis will say is weaker than the one that came up last season without giving opponents like Brighton, as accomplished as Brighton, a leg up, which they did today. Yeah, uh, James, I like your word that you've used there. I'm going to use it to uh, aid you right now. The accomplished Brighton, uh, a 5 0 <laughs> win. You're just, uh, well, you're in that, that group just between um, the top five, really, aren't you now? You still, you're back up there ahead of uh, West Ham and up with Newcastle United. There are still enough games to go to continue this. But um, you did what you had to, um, 
brilliantly today as always. Yeah, I'm, I'm just delighted that we're now being seen as accomplished. I mean, that, that, <laughs> when we're when we're like nearly going out of the league at Hereford, like in '97, it, we certainly weren't very accomplished then. But um, and, and 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 you know, as we say to anyone who listen, it, it's it's about the journey, not the destination. Yeah. Um, and you know, we're we're at the moment we're in a really good run of um, form as a club. Because you know we're in your, we're in the last sixteen in Europe. We're in the in the next round of the FA Cup. We're pushing for Europe again this season, and uh, you know it's it's mm. you know it's a long way from from League Two. Yeah, good to get and that second. Uh, at this point. Yeah, g- good to get that second league win though in twenty four. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we. I mean, it took us a while to even score um, uh, this this calendar year, but that's actually ten goals we put past um, Sheffield United this 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 year already. So sorry, sorry about that. Um, but you know, it, it's we've had a lot of injuries. We've had players away at Afcon. We've had players away at the at the Asia Cup. Um, you know, and we're starting to get those players back now. So hopefully, we we knew um, that the turn of the year was a time when we've actually got a try and push on we're similarly placed to the where we were about this time last year with a similar amount of points from the same amount of games so um but i mean last year was a bit of a strange one we obviously we had a, a, a truncated season we had a world cup in the middle of it we had teams like uh spurs and chelsea not um hitting, hitting their straps as they would normally do and and it, i'm not saying it was easier to qualify for europe last year but it's, there's a lot of mitigating factors but those sides are, are coming back into it Chelsea is starting to show some form Man United are starting to show some form um, you know and it, it's going to be tight to try and qualify for Europe again but you know getting that top spot in, in that Europa League competition um, and and basically essentially getting February off is a massive massive fillip for us because it like gives us a chance to get the players back and uh, and move forwards and hopefully and um, qualify for Europe again I mean I you know we we don't always like to talk about the games coming up soon but you play against two of the sides down at the bottom you'd expect to beat both of those no we wouldn't <laughs> well, okay, uh, I, that's okay. not the bright. That's not the bright way. I mean, two 0 up. We were thought uh, in the FA Cup game <laughs> in in January. We were two 0 up in that game as well, and we went in two two at half time. No, you know, it, uh, it's it isn't. You know, we we've struggled to keep clean sheets this season. So, yeah, I mean, you look at teams on paper. Yes, maybe you would say that. You should, you should be beating them. But we, we're not, we're not like that. We don't look at it that way. We just see each game as it comes, and you know, I mean, Everton was struggling last year, and that's who we got at the weekend, and they beat us five one at home last season. So you know, it's. Yeah. I'd like. Can I ask you both a, a a question? That I'm coming on to talk to referees in a moment, and uh, it wasn't an incident that I was watching in your game, but there was one today where uh, Marcus Rashford went into a challenge in the first half where. At, at best, you could say it was a, it was just a proper challenge um, with uh, the defender uh, on uh, Luton Town side. But he went down as if he basically uh, nearly had his head taken off. And I just we need to have some responsibility here. We need to change these things because a it's part of time wasting, which is becoming ludicrous, and b it just does not help anybody. He was up and springing about. I, I think if you go down with a head injury, we know if it's serious, and if it isn't serious and you're just faking it, and, I'm, and everybody can tell that, um, I think there's got to be some sort of discipline because this is getting ridiculous. They're not the only ones to do that. Oh, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. I mean, mean, I'm not saying. But that was the one I saw today. I've seen them. I mean, particularly. I mean, I go. I go away from home to watch Cambridge United, as much not as much as I can this season, as well at home. (laughs) But they'll waste their time. The keepers down half the time, groveling around on the floor, having got kicked in the you know what or ever, and then he's up bouncing and hitting the ball off the deck about (laughs) mid to the edge of the other penalty area. I mean, I know it goes on, but but it's. It's now been sort of accepted as part of the game, and that's the bit I don't like. I'll, I'll go with you first, then, James. 
Do you, do you know what? I, I wholeheartedly agree with you, Mark. It's something that absolutely infuriates me. As you can see, I'm of a certain age. Yeah. Maybe that's got maybe that's got something to do with yeah, it. I'm I don't sure it know. Has. But yeah, yeah. I, one of the things I think though, and, and do you know what? I've I've written columns on this. I've yeah. thought long and hard about this. I know we always talk about referees in this situation. And yes, the referees are part of this as well. They have a responsibility because they see the same things we do. They're even closer to the action than we are. Mm. So deal with it. But also, I think all of us, and I'm not speaking as a, as a journalist here, I'm talking as a football fan. The other way that we can do this, I think, is players have made it impossible for referees now. They're going down. If the referee doesn't, I mean, we saw this in Scotland recently, didn't we? If, yeah. if the referee doesn't blow his whistle, then they're absolutely castigated for not stopping play when somebody is injured. Let's all of us, whether it's our team or not, just call this what it is. It's cheating. Yeah. And it is. It's end of. And also, let's have managers and coaches as well call this out for what it is. Yeah. Failing that, stick him in the boxing ring and let them find out exactly what a problem well, for challenges. You know, AD, I mean, I know that people... Are, again, football will close down on everybody else that thinks that possibly 10 minutes in a sin bin is a good thing, which personally, uh, it certainly works um, in much lower leagues and junior football and, and things like that. It might not... Well, I don't know why it wouldn't work in, uh, in the Premier League. It would soon sort it out because people would say, oh, it's just going to waste more time and... 10 minutes for a key player, he won't be doing that too often. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a big fan of the blue card idea, admittedly. I mean, it, it, it's it's a nice idea, but in, in reality, it's not going to work. I mean, basically, what's going to happen if, you, if you, your goalkeeper has, like gets sin bin for descent? Well, they're not going to be able to bring on another goalkeeper, are they? So, it, it, there's, there's, there's obviously there's got to be a discussion. That there's, there's got to be conversation about it. We see, we see it all the time. This, this top. It, it, it is feigning injury, and if, you, if you're deemed to be feigning injury, then that's got to be a, 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 a booking. But you know, the players know if he, if a player's got a serious head injury or yeah. if, if there's a serious condition. Um, I mean, there, there's there's a few clubs in, in particularly in this division that are masters of, of of like, oh my head, oh my head. I mean, I'm looking at you, Fulham. Um, I'm looking at you, Everton. I mean, there, there's a lot of these um, clubs that they're doing it because I mean, the, the, it's it's a way to stop momentum. It's a way of yep. if you, if, a, if a team's getting up ahead of steam. I mean, Manchester City. I mean, Pep Guardiola. He he actually goes. He tells his players to to do these little these little niggly fouls to stop momentum. And it, it, it's it's unfortunately it's part and parcel of the game. Can we stop it? Yes. Would we like to stop it? Yes. Is it going to happen? Probably not. There we are. Uh, both of you have made some uh, great points, James and uh, AD. Thank you very much indeed for joining us tonight here on the Sunday Night Club. We uh, try to talk to people who uh, really care about the game, not just involved in it all the time either, but those that watch it and pay their money, get into their pockets and have a go to follow their fans up and down the land. Uh, we're going to talk to two referees, two very wise referees. Keith Hackett and Mark Halsey, they're next. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. The British fish industry has been hit by a perfect storm of problems. First, the pandemic, then Brexit, and now the economic recession. A woman can become a man, and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. David Cameron needs to worry about his own country, and frankly, he can kiss my ass. If boom, fantastic. We need a bit more of that in the UK. Well, She's saying there. what a lot of people think. Not if you can't then... call Hamas terrorists, I can't talk to you. Cut the interview. There is something to be said, though, about types of breed, that if they do no. turn, then no. you can be no. in trouble. I've got a cockapoo. No. If that cockapoo turns on me, I win the battle. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of the street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. Our only way out of the theater was through the stage. Right. Uh, so we actually had to, to pass right next to him, right in front of him. Mm -hmm. And at that point, he tried to get the entire crowd to chant with him, ceasefire now and free Palestine. Right. But you managed to get out and you must have been shocked. If we had lingered for over a minute, right. 
I think it would have come to physical violence. You've been having to fight again for compensation after having to fight to be believed, then fight to get your conviction quashed, to get what's rightfully yours. If Archetypes was as successful as they claim, why is Spotify willing to hand that over to Limonada to do whatever they want with it? What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> It may be that it's a more serious problem at the BBC than just her. I'm problem. giving her some objectivity because I think you've Why? got to look at someone. What are you well, going okay. up for? This is the point of the week, Michael. Will. <laughs> not the therapy session. <laughs> Nobody is, is spending any money. They're not prepared to do it. I mean, why is that? Uh, quite simple. The downturn in the spend is three simple words, financial fair play. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names. The New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? Ed Balls and, and George Osborne were asked, would you tell your kids to go into politics? And they both said no, no. Mm -hmm. because it's so nasty now, it's scary. I wouldn't, I wouldn't think they would be safe. Do not come <laughs> to the UK. All you will get is free accommodation, warmth, <laughs> food, education, yeah. health service. It's just not worth it. <laughs> That's it. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Well, we talk about uh, refereeing every week, quite rightly, because uh, it is really important and there are all so sorts of things going wrong at the moment with refereeing at different levels. At the highest level, uh, I don't think they know what they can and can't really do. They seem so worried at times about making any sort of decision that's wrong that will make them look foolish and stupid. They haven't grasped the game in a sense that the referee should be in control. I don't think it's easy, and it's not easy at any level because we've talked about it on many occasions, the time-wasting, the faking of in uh, injuries, all the other bits and pieces that now go on the whole time in most of a professional game. And it is, it's shameful, really. Keith Hackett and Mark Halsey are both with me. Uh, good evening to you, Keith. Good evening, Mark. Uh, even, uh, You're absolutely right. Oh, thank you. Good. And uh, Mark Halsey, uh, good evening to you. Your side that you're now managing won 2 0 today. As a referee and a top referee, how do you deal with uh, tripping and faking it and injuries as a, as a boss now? Oh, it, it's, it's difficult because uh, obviously the referees are not up to the sort of standard that uh, I used to referee at. But uh, no, they know who I am and I have to respect them and show respect to them, and um, which, I, which I always do. So, uh, yeah, it was a good 2-0 victory for us at, over at, uh, up at Alicante um, against Chastik. So it's good. It moves up into, I think, seventh in the table now. So we're doing well. So it was a good weekend for me because a great day at Ashton Gate, QPR, with a 1 0 win. Yeah. Try and get beat that job zone, keep away from Sheffield Wednesday. <laughs> Keith <laughs> seems. So, yeah. Keith, today for me, one very early, I mean, I haven't seen, to be fair, uh, an awful lot of the football this weekend yet, but I did watch the game between Luton and Manchester United. Yes. And, I, and I, I'm going to say this again because for all of the great things that Marcus Rashford has done so far in his footballing life uh, and away from football in other things, he's becoming a bit of a pain as far as I'm concerned. Again today, a, a, a challenge and he goes mm. down and it, it's worse than cheating for me. This yeah. is con, yeah. conning people. Yeah, there's, there's no question. I mean, I don't know what they set out to achieve, Mark. No. I can understand, you know, in the Sheffield United game, they went right, he went down to 10 men. And shortly afterwards, the goalkeeper suddenly gets injured, which then allows all the Sheffield United players to go towards the manager and reorganise the team. When we look at Marcus Rashford, he just stayed down as though he was going to go to sleep. Yeah. And, and he's rubbing his head when there's actually little or no contact. And my worry, and I keep saying it, is very much... The kids who are watching that game, because Radford is a star player, 
He's copied by many players around the world. He should be very proud of the shirt that he wears. He wasn't wearing it when he it came off the pitch, actually, today, Keith. That was another strange thing for me. One of his yes. taking, taking his shirt uh, off so that everybody could see his tattoos and what have you. But I, I just thought that was all strange. I mean... Um, is he being? I'm not talking about football managed. Is it, uh, is his agency? I think they're Americans, aren't they? Are they are they actually doing him any favours at the moment? No, they're not. And I think his manager really needs to take him to one side and have a fatherly word of advice. I think. Look, we know that this guy does lots of good things in the community, and everybody praises him. But he's getting paid to play football and he's getting played to play at the highest level with one of the world's top clubs. Please set a good example. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that he's disrespecting the game and he's disrespecting his fellow professionals when he goes down clutching his face when everybody sees it's a cheat. You um, know? Here's what, one other thing for both of you. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start with you, Mark. Uh, I just thinking this about what Keith was saying about you know players come across and have this early drink even if it's only five or ten minutes and get another bit of coaching and what have you. I can see clubs like oh not clubs um, television outlets like Sky, TNT, Amazon Prime, a lot of them with big American influence suddenly saying, you know what, why don't we have ad breaks during uh, uh, an injury uh, 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 you know no i know but this is the well, this is the state we're just about to get to if we don't watch it yeah no. listen no during during when it's in hot weather they do have that they do have a break they do have yeah a, but yeah in hot weather minutes. but listen um you know going back to what keith was saying i, I you know he's spot on and, and for me it's about it's not about the laws of the game all the time. It's about managing the game managing the players being in their ear all the time engaging with them and letting them know what you feel and they, they they respond to that and they respect they respect you for that um yeah listen look it's it, it, it is a problem with um with, with time and people going off to the side oh, yeah, listen if people want need a drink they need a drink they need to be and you know they, they need that um that that fluid in in their body when because they're athletes really so it's it, 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 it's it's a fine line, isn't it? It's a fine line, and how you how you deal with that with, with players mm. keep that one. Of yeah, but I mean, going. the fine line is such that I have no problem with going uh, to the edge of the pitch, and uh, one mm. of the uh, crates of uh, whichever sponsor that they use is is put down, and they pick them up and go back on the pitch, and then chuck it off again. They don't do that. They all mm. come off the pitch, and the the, the yeah. managers start to tell them what to do, and yeah. this is the way the opposition. Well, well, I mean, it's well, rubbish. Yeah. Well, the thing, well, the thing to but do. But Mark, is if, if, uh, if, 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 I can remember. Sorry, Mark. I can remember in the early 80s, refereeing on the North American Soccer League. Yeah. And, in, and I arrived in, in New York and was informed by the NASL, Phil Woosnam, that there would be a one-minute ad break in each half. And I had to pick the time. So there was a time when a player would go down. I would then cross my hands to signal that a one-minute stoppage was taking place. <laughs> The player's, been, the player's been treated after about 10 seconds, wants to get up, and I am, as the referee, saying, stay down, stay down, we've got a minute break. <laughs> <laughs> These are the sort of things we don't want in the English game, Mark. We no, don't want them. I, 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 I don't I, think we do. Listen, Mark, I think what, you know, if, if they do run off for, for, a, for a drinks break, then you know the players get up, just re referee restart play, they'll soon run back on, won't they? Yeah. Could I, I mean, here's something for both of you. And uh, uh, Keith, I'll come to you first. Watching all goalkeepers at the moment, whether, and, and Mark's a, a goalkeeper too, uh, yeah. and was a fine one. Allegedly. Uh, yeah. But, um, <laughs> no, I'm going to say it's fine. But Keith, you first of all, when they, go, when they catch a ball from wherever it is, a lot of them then sink to their knees and then they go flat down and everything. And they just stay there. Is it... Do, would the PGMOL and um, referees outside that as uh, as well? Would they sort of think about you know what? Let's just let's just time next weekend how much time the goalkeepers take between that ball in their hands and then getting rid of it. Not to punish them during that game, no, but no. to find out how much time is wasted. Well, you know the law, Monk. The law is yeah. quite specific. Six seconds, yeah. they have to distribute. Yeah. This is why the IFAB are now saying, well, because it's not being used and penalised by referees, that type of behaviour, let's let's open it up to eight seconds 
and then punish. But you know, this is this is we're we're changing the laws to meet weak refereeing. And and you're absolutely right. The PGMOL in England have the key to this. Mm. They should, through Howard Webb, dictate how their referees are going to officiate in terms of application of the law. And it's a little bit like a barometer. Do they want strict enforcement, like we see at the beginning of the season, and those 14 minutes and 10 minutes added on that are now three minutes and back to four, and we're back to normal. And and this is because the PGMOL are not policing it. Mm. So I, I'm in agreement with you. I think that the game needs to understand it's in the entertainment business that a lot of players, uh, spectators, switching the television off because they're not enjoying what they're seeing. Yeah. You know, I'm, yeah. Mark, what do you think? I agree with you. I think I think that the law has lapsed with 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 the six second law has has lapsed. And like Keith says, it's it's weak refereeing. You know, you you've got to be in the players' ear all the time, in the captain's ear, in the goalkeeper's ear, saying, "Listen, if you don't if you don't get rid of that ball quicker, I'm going to give an indirect free kick yeah. right yeah. on the six yard line." And and that will that will stop it. That will stop it. You know the referee. You know as referees, you'll have told them when well, the last thing you want to see your referees doing is giving yeah. indirect free kicks on the six-yard yeah. line. That's right. oh. well, that's, you know, you could, couldn't you, or on the eighteen-yard line? Yeah. So, yeah. You know, you, I just, you just I just them. want. I don't want twelve, fifteen minutes of uh, extra time being played. The game is ninety no. minutes, and I want to see three or four minutes. Yeah, if somebody's got injured, but that's about it, really. I don't. We don't yeah. want. We don't need any more than that. There is a lot of problems, courtesy of our useless train transport system these days, that nobody, you know, yeah. can hang around too much, particularly midweek yeah. and uh, on holidays and other things, and yeah. and, and, and don't get back. I mean, that, that's still important to me. But what I do want to see is that perhaps we should perhaps we should do it that for every uh, for every club that plays, get get a timing. So if you have wasted 10 minutes of that game, then every fan gets a 10% refund. Yeah. A no, I know bit you like, can laugh uh, at that. Yeah. Well, well, like, it's, it's, that's a little you know, bit like yeah. cricket, it's, isn't it, Mark? Yeah, it still has to be it's paid. Slow play. For, yeah, it still, has to, it still goes back to the club eventually. Yes. But that 10%, yeah. um, you know, you, so you're not cheated out of a game. No, that's yeah. right. Players and ca captains get fined in cricket, don't they, for slow play or slow yeah. over rate. Yeah, so, yeah. But the other thing, Mark, here is that we're seeing so many yellow cards being issued. Referees themselves are wasting a lot of time. Yeah. yeah. You know, we, we, I mean, today in the Manchester United game, we saw them flash like confetti. They were yeah. cautionable offences. But, you know, when that second caution for Casemiro should have been issued, it wasn't. Mm. And, and this is where I think referees have yeah. got to say, right, OK, there's a threshold. Can we raise it? <laughs> Reduce the number of yellow cards, or can we impact on them? Yeah, and uh, yeah. and this is why this is why we had all that nonsense about IFAB and the blue card. Mm. It was aimed at trying to enforce and put some weight into the yellow card. But well, I mean, Ted did straight away, didn't they? They took him off at half time. Yeah, know, yeah. I mean, they knew yeah. they knew it was <laughs> they knew it was on one. Yeah. But then, it, yeah, it, you it, know, he was lucky. He was lucky. You can, you can say he was well, lucky. To be fair. But yeah, you're looking, just... we're, looking, we're looking at that at the yellow cards. I mean, what we've got to remember is they were, they were the first. The first yellow card was 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 clear because it, it denied a promising attack. But then we had two or three, four um, careless challenges. Now that becomes then in, uh, persistent infringement of the laws of the game. So how many how many challenges do you allow? Four or five before you issue another yellow card um, mm. for that. So. I think he was on his. He was he was treading treading dangerously for 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 being sent off for, for a second yellow card. Um, I know that the I know the Six Nations are back uh, in rugby next week, Keith. And yes. uh, there's a very good piece uh, in the Sunday Times today um, from uh, you know how from what Lawrence Delalio had said uh, a week ago. The delays that mar the game and writers and columnists have all um, had their say today. I think it's the sort of thing that needs to be sorted because rugby wants the the game to be speeded up, and I'm interested yeah. to see what happens here because I think football needs to follow. Yeah, I, I mean, what tends to happen when you look at rugby and they come up with these great ideas, 
Uh, it took me an age to convince the Premier League that we should have communication kits <laughs> to follow the to follow rugby. Uh, so I think that when we actually look at these things, the analysis that is now produced by the Premier League and each Premier League club, they've got it in minutiae. And therefore, I think in that sense, they've got the information, look at it and see how they can influence the game. You know, in the MLS, Dan Gerber, who runs the MLS, he's very cute on these sorts of things. He, he, he impacts, the league want to impact because it's in competition and make these sort of changes. But, you know, we yeah. still get daft things happening in our game. I mean, Mason Olgate today, yeah. I mean, like, puts in a challenge that's not worthy of a professional footballer and rightly gets sent off. But the referee should have issued a red cut straight away, goes for a yellow. I, I, I don't understand that. No, I'm with you both on that. And one of the other things and uh, that uh, I, I wanted to just sort of round off and talk to here about is... Um, you you both would be able to spot decent referees at 14, 15, 16, I guess, at, at very junior levels or with children and whatever else is going on and, and others. I've always thought, because of the technology, is way beyond people like you and me, Keith, I'm sure. Mark Halsey will th tell us that, that he's brilliant <laughs> at it all. But yeah. we need to yeah. be looking at the ge the next generation that wants to become referees and say... How can we get things like communication right, proper, and much quicker? Because they'll know. Yeah, that, that's, that's investment. You know, I mean, the investment in terms of education, good coaching, uh, you know, it's the coaching aspect mm -hmm. where I think there's a complete weakness within the country. We need to actually encourage referees. I mean, I communicate regularly with, with young referees. And they're very positive. They, you know, it's competitive, and they're they're in with a good show. They've got to be given the opportunity. And in fairness to Howard Webb, he brought in this weekend Lewis Smith mm -hmm. for his first game, and he, and of course he he brought in Allison Sam Allison a, a few weeks ago and Re Rebecca Welsh. So I think that the, he must recognise, in fairness to him, that they need some new blood into that into that group. <laughs> But then but you've got to give them a run of games. Can I just come in there? Have you got, yeah. I mean, what, yes. What's the idea? What is the idea of select group two? Well, Tell I don't. Me. I don't think uh, you know. I, I don't think it serves a purpose. What's the, Mark. What, I, I, what's, it, what's, what's the idea? What? Those those referees in that select group two are supposed to be going on up into into the Premier League. <laughs> so what they're doing now, you've got referees that are refereeing really well in select group two, okay, and then you've got these referees that they've got on this uh, elite refereeing panel system. Yeah. Where they pay twenty thousand a year extra to be on that panel, and some of them I understand are not even nowhere near the top five yet. They're putting them in in these games. What about these referees in select group two who are refereeing week in week out in a championship, who are good referees and not getting the chance to referee at the, at the, at the highest level? But that's exactly the same. There's all that, that, that's the same like the cartel that there is within the Premier League itself itself with the clubs. Yeah. You know, they'll all yeah. they'll all sit and agree about. You know, all of the money for charity uh, during COVID down to the lower yeah. leagues. It, it, it doesn't happen. No, they just correct. say these things. Talk is yeah. cheap at the top of our football game. And I think it's yeah. cheap at the top of our refereeing game. And they need to sort it out. Have every referee in the position where, yes, you are going to be refereeing at the highest level, but you might not be doing that every single week. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, Mark, uh, we, we're we going back then to the old system of 50, 52 referees on the Football League, as it was, and they could referee fourth, third, second, first division. Mm. And, you know, you were lucky if you got a first division match each month. So I, there was that mix. There wasn't, you know, a couple of seasons ago, I, I, I recall Michael Oliver refereed Liverpool seven times in one season. That's too great an exposure to one referee. Succession planning is the key, but within that mix, you know, when you look at people like Mar, who's played the game at a reasonable level, mm. they are natural referees. Mm. And therefore, the governing body, the FA and the, Pre the Premier League, should see that if they can encourage, they've got all these academies, if they could encourage these kids... Mm out of the academies, a few of them to become referees, give them the career path, give them the coaching, then we might have a, 
a seed change that's required because the standards of officiating is not good enough. Because there's too many manufactured referees, Keith. That's the problem. They're knocking all the natural ability out of some of our good young referees. That's yes. what's the problem. That's the problem with the training and coaching, the education of our young referees. Yes. We had yeah, a referee. No we had a referee uh, the other day at the uh, Abbey Stadium that for the second half kickoff, he he made it happen four times because somebody encroached or whatever or done something. And in the end, he just said, "Oh, get on with it." There was no advantage yeah. going on, but he needed no. to. He needed to then run up to both captains and said, I, "I know what you've done here, or whatever. You know, I want this game to flow, and that's all it would have needed, really." Uh, you, Mark, what we're seeing at the moment is reactive refereeing right through the structure, rather than proactive refereeing, which involves the quiet word. The public rebuke at times and and the and, liaison and, between players and, and referees. Your reaction has got to finish right now. Want to get to grips with the stories that really matter? To cut through the spin and the BS. Want unvarnished and fiery debate? Then join us for Cross Talk. One o'clock every weekday. Republic of Mike Graham. Weeknights at 8 on Talk TV. This is Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. The British fish industry has been hit by a perfect storm of problems. First, the pandemic, then Brexit, and now the economic recession. A woman can become a man, and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. David Cameron needs to worry about his own country, and frankly, he can kiss my ass. If boom, fantastic. We need a bit more of that in the UK. Well, She's saying what a lot of people think. Not if you can't then... call Hamas terrorist, I can't talk to you. Cut the interview. There is something to be said, though, about types of breed, that if they do no. turn, then no. you can be no. in trouble. I've got a cockapoo. No. If that cockapoo turns on me, I win the battle. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of the street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. Our only way out of the theatre was through the stage. Right. Uh, so we actually had to, to pass right next to him, right in front of him. Mm -hmm. And at that point, he tried to get the entire crowd to chant with him, ceasefire now and free Palestine. Right. But you managed to get out and you must have been shocked. If we had lingered for over a minute, right. I think it would have come to physical violence. You've been having to fight again for compensation after having to fight to be believed, then fight to get your conviction quashed, to get what's rightfully yours. If Archetypes was as successful as they claim, why is Spotify willing to hand that over to Limonada to do whatever they want with it? What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> It may be that it's a more serious problem at the BBC than just her. I'm problem. giving her some objectivity because I think you Why? to look at someone. Why are you well, going okay. that for? This is plank of the week, Will. <laughs> not the therapy session. <laughs> Nobody is, is spending any money. They're not prepared to do it. I mean, why is that? Uh, quite simple. The downturn in the spend is three simple words, financial fair play. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? Ed Balls and, and George Osborne were asked, would you tell your kids to go into politics? And they both said no, no. Mm -hmm. because it's so nasty now. It's scary. I wouldn't, I wouldn't think they would be safe. Do not come <laughs> to the UK. All you will get is free accommodation, warmth, <laughs> food, education, yeah. health service. It's just not worth it. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
This is Talk TV. Good morning, it's just gone six o'clock. I'm Jeremy Kyle. And I'm Nicola Thorpe. Welcome to Talk Today. Look, I'm getting ready for my new primetime show on Talk TV and Radio, seven o'clock Saturday night, James Whale Unleash. I don't need you coming in here, following me around with a car. I'm so sorry about this. Saturdays at seven on Talk TV. Well, a very good evening to you and welcome to the second hour of the show, which we are uh, now going to take up uh, over the coming weeks a particular issue, a particular topic, something that we have visited on the Sunday Night Club before, perhaps we haven't at times, but one that is very relevant at the moment. And to find out exactly how far uh, and what is still needed to nudge people who've begun to make decisions. So today... It is always uh, a great delight to welcome Sharon Davis, our former Olympic swimmer, to the show. Uh, she will be joined by the Director of Sport Fair Play for Women in Fiona McEnay and also by Caroline Downey, uh, who is uh, education reporter at the National Review and um, will be very much part of this next hour. Uh, first of all, Sharon... Uh, Happy New Year to you, and it's good to see you. Oh, and uh, you. I know, I, I know, we're well, we're well into February, but <laughs> uh, what's important for me is how far we've got after some of the things that happened towards the end of twenty twenty three, and and where do we need to go next to continue to police governing bodies that I never totally trust. Yeah, absolutely. So the place that we're in is really an awful lot different than it was sort of six months ago. Um, we've got big sports like track and field, aquatics, uh, rowing in the UK, although not in the World Federation, uh, British triathlon have been really good. Uh, volleyball, obviously rugby started off both union and league. They were the very first in the world to actually do a very in-depth study and to say that it was you know, an increased risk to have males actually playing rugby against females. Um, but we still got 60 sports in the UK, including six combat sports, would you believe? That's fighting sports uh, that allow males to self-ID to actually fight females. So the science hasn't changed. Um, 18 studies out there, um, one which, you know, one of the last ones was published in the British Medical Journal after 14 years showing that the reduction by taking, you know, the, hormones, cross-sex hormones, made practically no difference whatsoever. Mm. So the difference on average is about 20% between male and female performance, anything between 10 and 30 at Olympic sports. So the more explosive a sport is, the bigger the advantage. And what is quite new is that since January, we've had two very big reports out, one of which Fiona will tell you a lot more about because it was a, a fair play for women report, but showing that this is impacting participation by young girls and women in sport. So men's sport has um, returned to the levels pre-COVID, women's sport still has not. And we have got lots of testimony now from, you know, from women across 35 different sports showing that parents are removing their children from contact sports like football, where they worry that they're that you know they're going to get injured, and it will be injury so that will will stop them from participating in those sports going forward. So if ever they think there's a male on the opposition, they will withdraw their their daughters. Um, and also we've got girls that are giving up because. We've got testimony, for example, from a 13-year-old girl who was a goalkeeper and she lost her place to a boy who just identifies, right? These aren't children that are doing anything with their testosterone levels no. whatsoever. They're just going, today I feel like a girl. And they are losing their position on girls' teams. So that 13-year-old goalkeeper just walked away from the game. And we've got testimony from 35 sports like that. Mm -hmm. So it is very much impacting. And now I suppose the, the latest you know, conversation point has been park run. And the debatical over the fact for the last five years, since 2019, when the rules changed to gender rather than sex, um, we've lost 20 records that are now held, women's records that are now held by males. And we've been trying to shout about this for five years. When Park Run eventually decided to remove the records, because that was what they, they, they got, you know, eventually they decided they would do something. 
um, took 24 hours before it was all over every single news channel because it was affecting men. Yeah. And that's the position that we're in. You know, when it affects men, things get done and it gets stopped and fair play is the priority. When it affects women, it seems we're at the bottom of the pile. And that's what's so disheartening in 2024. Yeah, and I mean, you know, just to add to, to what you've, you've said there, just genetically, when you mention all of these power sports, if I can call them that way between yeah. the two, you know, we have all of the information we need, don't we? With upper limb strength of 40 to 50% difference from males and females, lower limbs 20 to 40% as well. And 12 kilograms more skeletal muscle mass for men yeah. over women. Yeah. Why and, and is it that people think they can argue structure. against all of this? Why do they, they still can't. think they can? Yeah, well, they can't. That's the, you know, that is the point, Mark. And, and there has been an awful lot of uh, attempting at stopping debate. So yeah. we've worked our way through that now, and we are allowed to debate at last. But but even now, you know, every time we bring any research, any time there is a, a, you know, a situation like the park run, the abuse that gets hurled at women who are literally just asking for what men get. That's all that they want is the same equality to fair records and fair competition that males get. They're not asking for anything extra. They're just asking for the same. And the abuse that women get is extraordinary. I mean, Mara, who I know you've had on your show, I think, but I've done quite a lot on, on, you know, on, on talk TV, you know, has had so much abuse. And this is a woman who, you know, is uh, an absolute elite marathon runner that's competed for her country and a very, very clever lady as a diplomat, you know, that's lived abroad for many years. And all we're doing is presenting the evidence, nothing more. We're not making facts up. We're presenting the science, we're protected, presenting the evidence. And it's just so disheartening, you know, mm. to say that Park Run doesn't have an element of competition is utterly ridiculous. Re report results up to fairly recently were actually used in British athletics on the power of 10, um, you know, and athletic data um, that was able to be transferred from the times that was done at Park Run to official records on websites held by British athletics. And there are records and there are placings. If there's a placing, it's competitive in any shape or form. If we go this person's first and this person's last, that is competition. Yeah. <laughs> Whether you try hard or no, the person who was first probably did. So to turn around and say it's not got an element of competition, you know, in every, I mean, I'm so pro people doing sport. I've spent my whole life mm. trying to encourage more people to do sport and be physically active. I wouldn't want anyone to be dissuaded from doing park run. All we're ever asking for is can the records and the placings be fair for people that are biologically female? But, but, and in this but, NH, that seems a ridiculous thing to actually have to ask for. Well, this is the thing, isn't it, Sharon? I, who really out there, apart from the, those sort of people that want to jump on the latest bandwagon just to stir things up, without any knowledge or any idea, who really wants to have things like, again, you mentioned what's happened in park run uh, again the, the hand grip between a woman and a man uh, in newtons which is the way they measure this it, it is so vastly different that any anything to do with boxing and uh, and other other yeah. where those where those fists are gripped are, are going to cause so, real damage if a, no, if so a man or a trans boxing. woman is allowed to take on another woman I know. I'm going to tell you about boxing, which is really, really shocking. So uh, obviously a very explosive sport. And we are talking about pound for pound equal weight here, OK? We're not yeah. talking about, you know, a big tall girl and a small guy or a smite. We're talking about people of equal weight and equal size. A male will hit 160% harder than a female onto a less dense bone structure. And this is a serious accident waiting to happen. Now, World Boxing have said, we're not going to allow it. We're just going to, we're going to organize, you know, transgender events, which is great because we do have to make space for everybody. Of course. But in places in, in America and Canada and Australia, they're still allowing this to actually happen. The same as they're allowing things like rugby to actually happen, um, even in schools, you know, and we will see a very, very serious accident. Someone will have a life-changing accident or maybe even lose their life. Um, so when boxing eventually decided that they were going to protect the female category, the reason that they did it was because men said, we will not box females in the male category. Hmm. So if you turn around and say that transgender women, biological males can go into the female category, you're going to have to allow transgender men biological females to go in the men's category and we're likely to kill somebody and then we'll be done for manslaughter and because the men had a problem it was stopped yeah and i mean just even other things that i mean all these questions are out there i was looking at some of the the, the most asked at uh, 
uh, before we came on the air. You know, what scientific uh, evidence, this is one that I uh, really thought, exists regarding the physical advantages or disadvantage that transgender women may have in sports compared to cis, uh, spelt C-I-S for those yes. that don't know, cisgender women? Well, just women, because we don't like the word cis. I know. We don't subset of women we are just women transgender women are transgender women and they are male and they will always be male um and women are just women <laughs> so, so um you know you know from that straight away that there's a bias on it there's 18 studies all peer-reviewed that say that you cannot remove male puberty advantage these are the studies that world aquatics world track and field have used all oh. right so and there's not a single study in the world that shows that you can mitigate male puberty or even male advantage remove the word puberty just male advantage so there's the science for you straight away mm. um and also we don't really need it do we you know we've got every single olympic result ever in history to know that males and females are different mm. that's why we have categories in sport that's why we don't allow 15 year old boys to play with 12 year old boys but you know because we know that it will be dangerous but it's also unfair so we have categories across all sorts of different things whether that's age categories sex categories weight categories or para categories in the paralympics to offer opportunity across society that we deem as fair. And to turn around and just go that I'm going to identify into the women's category. And mm. again, what we see is that females who identify as males don't do that. They carry on and race with females, happily identifying as males if that's what they want to do. And no mm. female has a problem with it, providing they're not on testosterone, which is illegal and against the rules. Um, when World Aquatics put on an event in October of last year, because they said they wanted to obviously, you know, make sure they were inclusive. Of course, everybody could have raced in their own sex category anyway. They were always inclusive. No one was ever banned ever from sport. They never will be. No. But when they put this event on in October in Berlin, not a single trans athlete turned up. Yeah, I know. So that tells you everything you need to know. It, exactly was, that. They didn't want to be included. They wanted to race females because that's where they had the advantage. And of course, the Leah Thomas, you know, debatical showed us exactly how big an advantage that was to go from over a thousandth in the world. So we often throw the figure 465 around because that was in college swimming. But actually, if you actually put all the times together in the world, Leah Thomas wasn't even in the top 1000. And then they beat three American Olympic silver medalists at the National College Championship finals yeah. in the space of a year. That does not happen. People do not go from a thousand to number one, <laughs> you know, in a year at six foot four. It, it, it's just cheating. And there is no other word for it than cheating right in everybody's vision. So, you know, for those that um, want to transition and want to be part of sport, if they want to do these things, why don't they understand that actually then taking on other people who want to do exactly the same of you is terrific for all of you. Yeah, and we want everyone to do sport. You know, yeah. whether this is creating new categories, whether this is creating new LGBTQ, you know, groups or clubs or, or teams or, or even, you know, their own Olympics or whatever they want to call it. But at the end of the day, the whole premise of sport is to make it fair. Otherwise, there is absolutely no point to it. And 51% of this world is biologically female. So I just don't understand how that huge part of the world, half of us, don't deserve the same as this half over here. You know, and, and it's just misogynistic, really. There's no other word for it. And I have to say, I've been involved in elite sport now for 50 years. I'm 62 this year. And I competed for England when I was 11. Mm. Um, and I have never seen so much misogyny as is around today. I mean, it's just so depressing. And I'm, you know, I'm a mum of a daughter and I'm now a grandmum of a granddaughter. And it really scares me where we're going forward at the moment with the protection for safe spaces, for equal opportunities. Um, you know, that there's a huge um, media reports today about um, males and females prisons, you know, mm. and how unsafe those females feel. And yet their voices are not being heard. We're not even being able to get a voice. No, I completely understand that, and that is why uh, I'd like your voice to be with us throughout this hour. Sharon, as I've mentioned, uh, Fiona uh, is going to join us next, Director of Sport, Fair Play for Women, and uh, then we're going to also be joined by Caroline uh, Downey later on. And I want you to be very much... I'll, I'll try and conduct it, but you guys okay. are the experts, so <laughs> I, I want you to be very much at the front of things, and, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll find out where everybody thinks this pendulum is swinging back to. This is Talk TV.
How are you going to stop the votes? This is an international problem. How's that going for your party? I'm a millennial. You're a Victorian, I think. The illness helps weather people. I'm going to help the vet office. <laughs> I'm Jeremy Kyle. And I'm Nicola Thorpe. Welcome to Talk Today. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. The British fish industry has been hit by a perfect storm of problems. First, the pandemic, then Brexit, and now the economic recession. A woman can become a man, and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. David Cameron needs to worry about his own country, and frankly, he can kiss my ass. If boom, fantastic. We need a bit more of that in the UK. Well, she's there. saying what a lot of people think. Not if you can't then... call Hamas terrorists, I can't talk to you. Cut the interview. There is something to be said, though, about types of breed, that if they do no. turn, then no. you can be no. in trouble. I've got a cockapoo. No. If that cockapoo turns on me, I win the battle. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of the street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. Our only way out of the theater was through the stage. Right. Uh, so we actually had to, to pass right next to him, right in front of him. Mm -hmm. And at that point, he tried to get the entire crowd to chant with him, ceasefire now and free Palestine. Right. But you managed to get out, and you must have been shocked. If we had lingered for over a minute, right. I think it would have come to physical violence. You've been having to fight again for compensation after having to fight to be believed, then fight to get your conviction quashed, to get what's rightfully yours. If Archetypes was as successful as they claim, why is Spotify willing to hand that over to Liminato to do whatever they want with it? What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <it's here. laughs> It may be that it's a more serious problem at the BBC than just her. I'm problem. giving her some objectivity because I think you might look at someone. Why are you well, doing okay. that for? This is plank of the week, Will. <laughs> bloody therapy session. <laughs> Nobody is, is spending any money. They're not prepared to do it. I mean, why is that? Uh, quite simple. The downturn in the spend is three simple words: financial fair play. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? Ed Balls and, and George Osborne were asked, would you tell your kids to go into politics? And they both said no, right. because it's so nasty now, it's scary. I wouldn't, I wouldn't think they would be safe. Do not come <laughs> to the UK. All you will get is free accommodation, warmth, <laughs> food, education, yeah. health service. It's just not worth it. <laughs> That's it. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Well, this is our special hour, and if you're just joining us here and think, well, I wanted to hear this right from the very start, our uh, Back of the Stand podcast on Wednesday, which is the second podcast that we uh, put out here on all the main sites, wherever you get your podcasts from. Uh, Monday is uh, a look at some of the, the big moments uh, in the Sunday Night Club, and then on Wednesday we take a topic like uh, we are doing here tonight. Delighted to say that Sharon Davis is with me uh, for the uh, full hour, and we're joined now by uh, Fiona McEnay and uh, Fiona, Director of Sport, Fair Play for Women. I was, uh, I've read, uh, I've been reading a lot of your articles over the years, and the, the, some of the frustrations as well that you must have 
in that there is always a problem with some people wanting the results to be right for them. Yeah, and, and probably the most common argument we've heard is people saying, people in sports bodies saying, well, it doesn't really affect many people because there are only a few trans players in sport. So what's your problem? Why don't you just accommodate them? And that's a particularly frustrating argument because first of all, nobody knows how many there are because you're not allowed to talk about it. And, and, and there are no sports bodies who are really counting. Um, you know, they might know they've got some, but they really can't say it's not a problem. Um, the second problem with that is that why, if those trans women matter, why wouldn't women and girls matter just as much? The real issue is that one trans identifying male, one male in a sport affects dozens of women. And um, you might remember, Mark, before Christmas, there was a story about a, a football, a women's football league in Sheffield, mm. where there was one male who wanted to play in a women's team. And the impact that had on, on, on all the other teams, the players' own teammates were worried about training and getting hurt in training. The opposing teams were worried about getting hurt. They all said it was really unfair because this player could take the ball at one end of the field and just run up to the other end. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that, actually. Um, just to sort of let people know where we were talking about here. I think the, the, the lady's name was Francesca Needham, and it was in the Sheffield Hallam area where suddenly it was ruining uh, games and certain clubs did withdraw from playing against them. Yeah, I mean, they tried to get the local FA to help them out. Um, there wasn't... The, 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 the problem we've got is that the policy that says that uh, a, a male who says that they identify as a woman has priority means that that one player... Francesca Needham was allowed to play and it didn't matter about the impact on all the others. And it, as you say, it had a, a devastating effect. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's a little bit like if you picture, if you remember the fast show, you remember competitive dad who could pick up the ball at one end and run to the other end. And that's what it's like because one player who's male can be so much faster that the others just don't get, don't get the ball. And they were afraid of being injured if they did tackle. So mm -hmm. they just had to back off. Yeah, no, look, you, you, you make some great points. I mean, Sharon, this is... You know, you've you've been following this down the generations, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and as I have, I mean, I have a daughter who is, uh, plays a lot of different sports. She she played up to a reasonable standard at school. I would that the, the horrors that she would go through though now playing uh, possible rugby, whether it was touch or whether it was full on or um, other even even netball, <laughs> which sounds crazy, but there is that physicality and and strength involved as well. You well, know, explosive I, power. You yeah. know, when you're jumping for a ball or you're defending, you know, you know, if, if you there is, jump three feet higher, I, you're going to make a big difference. Exactly. But, but the, those that want to change everything so that the, 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 the trans women can do this together, I'll come to you, Sharon, and then to you, Fiona, is you know, just talk to, talk to anybody at any school level who's not got themselves caught up in where the pendulum has gone, and they say, well, this is absolute rubbish. You know, we I want know. Our, our daughters and sons to do what is right in their individual sports, learning what is wrong with, let's say, rugby and progressive rugby and other things that are now helping us so much more. But in other sports, that you, you can play mixed hockey, but you're not going to play mixed hockey um, for a gold medal unless everybody really is mixed. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what we also find is... Even though things like rugby, you know, rugby league, rugby union in this country and the world body have said um, they do not want males in the female game, when you get to provisional games, if somebody is playing on a team and we have a referee who's who doesn't feel empowered to do anything about it, they have to have the strength of character to be able to walk up to that person and ask them if they're male. And then if they say that they are, or even if they're not prepared to give the information, have enough commitment to be able to send them off the field. We have finding that volunteers are not volunteering anymore because they don't want to be put in that position. So that's also ruining the game, you know, as well. Um, football, we estimate that there's at least 50 trans-identifying males in the female game in the English league in this country. Mm -hmm. And many of them are goalkeepers because their explosive power is so very useful and their extra height and their, you know, bigger yeah. hands. So that's where they have a huge benefit. Um, so it, it's it's extremely difficult to quantify it constantly because as Fiona said, it's really hard to get these governing bodies to actually work with us and to deal with us because they're all putting their heads in the sand and they're all hoping that some terrible accident is gonna happen to a different federation so that then they can all do the right thing. 
But if we can get them to pole, which is what we've managed to do with, you know, with swimming, with track, with rowing, those poles come out massively in favour of fair sport. So yeah. that's what they need to do. But but most of them won't even do that. We can't even get them to poll their members so they can get an honest feedback, you know, as to what their members want. Yeah. And I mean, I know it's only Twitter, but yeah. you know, I did a Twitter Twitter survey. We had sixty thousand people respond in the space of twenty four hours, and ninety seven percent said they wanted fair sport. Yeah. So one of the other things, Fiona, that really worries me at times, and having read some of these different things over 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 the last few years is where so many of those that say testosterone suppression reduces male performance advantage to about um, to, that can compare uh, favorably with typical differences between male and female elite athletes. Um, and and this, th th these are just stuff that, of dreams, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, it's absolute nonsense. I mean, and, it, and there have been maybe 18, 20 studies now published to say, forget, you're wasting your time with testosterone suppression. That's just a fig leaf. But what I, I would say, just building on what Sharon said, is that in any case in practice, that doesn't happen because what you have is people turn up for a game and you know you can be refereeing or, or say umpiring a cricket match and there can be someone who's obviously male because everyone can see it. Mm. Um, but the, the umpire cannot call them out for it. Now, as it happens, the ECB, the England and Wales Cricket Board, they don't even bother with testosterone suppression. Their policy is self-ID, and they're saying that um, you can, if someone is clearly too strong, too powerful, the umpire can call them off. But we know, because we've heard from umpires and we've heard from coaches, exactly as Sharon says, they can't do that. They can't risk being called transphobic. So there's no control on this at all. And, and people can't say anything, but when they are polled anonymously, typically you get 80 to 90% of people in a sport who will say, look, I want everyone to be involved, but for the women and girls to have fair sport, they have to have a category just for themselves. Yeah, look, exactly that. Cricket was one of my main sports. And again, I, I just go back that the difference of the 40, 50% for upper limb strength and the way that you can deliver a ball. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I mean, I'm just going to show you this report, which people can get off our website. Okay, brilliant. Because in there, we've got stories from something like 25 different sports, including cricket. And those are all stories from women and girls who have been silenced in their sport. Um, some have been actually driven out of their club. Uh, that's how bad this is. And that's why it's great that we're talking about it, because mm. it's a big problem and it's a growing problem. Just just tell us your website now and we'll ask you and, and, the, and that specific paper that you've got. there. Yeah, it's on the front page. So if they go to fairplayforwomen.com, they'll yeah. find it and they can yeah. download a PDF. I mean, I've I've tried to chase various different uh, bodies of uh, sports around the world <laughs> over the last five decades now. And one thing that I've found a lot is very much in the way even the FA are treating all of this in this country still, that they just don't really want to know. And they, But by not wanting to know, not wanting to do it properly, they seem to think the problems are going to go away. Mm. Yeah, and I mean, they're just going to get worse. Yeah, they're well, afraid of being sued. As Sharon yeah. said, they'd like someone else to sort it out first, so yeah. they don't want to. But we shouldn't have to wait for that because so many girls are already being put off sport um, or they're afraid or they don't want to go to the changing room because there could be a male in there, you know. So it's not because there's anything problematic about people who are trans identifying. It's simply because women and girls, want we want our own changing rooms, we want our privacy and we want our own teams. I think that's a really good point. And Sharon, you'll be able to talk more about this going right the way back. I know in it, the, the difference for you when you were a, a, a star in, in swimming was because of the dr drug cheats and other things. But w we have to remember, if you develop yourself from a very young age and you reach the pinnacle of Olympic sport, you always knew in the call room, didn't you, whether you were taking on fair, fair competitors okay. yeah. or not? I mean, it, for for my particular generation, which is the biggest reason that I speak out, you know, because it affected my generation and my friends so very badly, and nothing was done for twenty years. So, just for those people that that don't realise, um, the East, the old East German uh, era, these young girls were given testosterone, many from the age of eleven and twelve. So they had a male puberty, and it meant that they totally dominated swimming, track and field, rowing, for literally nearly twenty years. And you know, my particular Olympics, I was one of only three people that wasn't East German that won a medal in the swimming pool. 
um, and I was lucky enough to be doing a 400 meter individual medley, which is quite a long race. Um, and so therefore that endurance reduced the advantage enough so that I could beat two East Germans, but not the one who set the world record, which stood for, for nearly 18 years. Um, you know, and since then they've admitted what they were taking. Uh, we found the, the, you know, all of the records of what they were taking through no fault of their own. You know, this was young girls that were put on a system by men um, to basically sporting propaganda to win stacks of Olympic and European and world medals, which they did for an extremely long time. They had very deep voices, they had five o'clock shadows, they had poor skin, uh, they had male development, and they totally naturally dominated. And they would arrive at an international, a world or an Olympics, and we'd never seen them before. And they would go in and break a world record. And this was because of the testosterone that they had during puberty, which is nowhere near as big or as strong as males who have that testosterone through puberty. And they dominated the world of women's sport. And for 20 years, the IOC did absolutely nothing to stop it. So I have friends that came fourth behind three East Germans, you know, who, whose whole lives would have been different if they had been Olympic champion. So one of the things that Fiona said, which always rings to me, is that when they say, well, it's only one or two, A, it's not, it's hundreds. We've got records of at least 800 across international sports um, that, you know, they're affecting at the moment, uh, women's results. But even if it's one, that one female that's been displaced, why is her opinions, her feelings and her equal opportunity so unimportant that she's supposed to just move over? So in her own race, in her own category, yeah. I just it's irrelevant whether it's one or 10,000. You yeah. know, it just needs to be fair. Well, it, it, exactly that, Fiona. And I mean, w one of the questions here that I don't think half of these uh, uh, bosses of these sports ever really ask and and it, and it's a genuine in one in that how can we balance the inclusivity and the fairness in sport ensuring that transgender athletes have opportunities to compete while also maintaining competitive integrity that the whole question is there to be answered isn't it yeah well let me tell you what what we think um your identity doesn't matter in sport and it shouldn't no no one should be excluded from any sport because of their identity or their sexual orientation or anything else that isn't relevant all that matters is your body and your body's either male or female and we we can be inclusive of everyone by having for example as swimming have done a female in an open category so you don't have to declare anything you don't want to declare but the female category is an inclusion measure mm -hmm. That's how we let women and girls have fair sport. So we can't let male bodies into female competitions. That's not inclusive. That starts to exclude women and girls. And where are we in making sure that this now is seeing sense? The pendulum on so many things over the last decade has swung a long way uh, away from how a lot of people think on a lot of things. Is it beginning to swing back? Are we getting these governing bodies to be able to sit down and listen to people like yourselves? Fiona first. Well, Sharon mentioned some of the sports that have made a change already, um, but there are many still to go, and a lot of them don't want to hear from women and girls who object. They make it very difficult for people in their own sport to speak up. Some of them will speak to us, but they still think, they seem to think that males with a trans identity matter more. And until we, you know, to me that it just seems basically sexist, you know, so until we get them to recognize that the female category is the only way to have fairness for women and girls, you can't start including other people in that category, then uh, we've still got a long way to go. Yes, I mean, football, as Sharon mentioned, I think is now the biggest sport in the UK that hasn't protected the female category. And it's a big problem. Yeah, it, it really is Sharon, isn't it? It is a big problem. Um, I think the way that we're going and the way that we, we and, and it, we shouldn't have to do this, right? The, our governing bodies should be doing this for us because it's their job to protect fair sport and it's their job to protect females as much as males. But the way we're going, and, and Fiona can tell you a lot more about it because she's very much in touch with Lynn, mm. is court cases. And it's been quite difficult. You know, when we've got young people, they are so intimidated to come forward. Um, and they're obviously very reliant on their sponsorship money and... So it's it's hard to get them to break to to break you know the silences. I hear it. They speak to me. They speak to Fiona. They come on the. I have phone calls every single week from from young people in tears. You know, not knowing how they deal with this. Um, and as I said, we keep trying to push the governing bodies for polling. And then when they poll, then then they you know have to be have to react. 
But I think court cases possibly is the way forward. In every gender, gender critical court case we've had, we've won. Yeah. Um, and we've now got one happening in Poole in, in, uh, in the UK. Uh, Lynn Pinch is incredibly brave to be doing what she's doing. We had it with the anglers. But what we're finding is it's falling almost to middle-aged women that have got the courage of their convictions to say, I'm not going to accept this. I want to make my sport fair for the generations that come behind me. So rather than trying to get young people to come together, and you know, the argument we hear all the time is, well, why don't young women just not race? Yeah. It really isn't that easy. No. You're asking them to give their dream up. You know, if they've got one Olympics in them, you're asking for them to, to walk away from that. Or they're made to sign contracts. Yeah. I, which says they're not allowed to talk about these no, things. I, un, I, un, so, I understand all of, so it's, all of that. It's not as easy as them just saying, we're not going to race. You know, we do know the cyclists came together behind the scenes and they put a lot of pressure on British cycling and British cycling eventually were made to do the right thing. But they had to be literally blackmailed into doing the right thing, um, which is extraordinary, isn't yeah. it? When we have the success that we have in women's cycling, that those women's cycling were so disposable that you know they had to threaten yeah. to not be not to not to race and fiona thank you very much for being part of this with us it's something we will revisit and keep an eye on of course because that's what we do with this um, sunday night club but a final sort of overall thought for you here we i don't really want to talk about winning and losing as far as this is concerned it because it should just all be winning yeah i think my you know what we'd like to see is more mums and dads speaking up because as Sharon explained, it's really tough on girls coming up through their sport. Um, they're afraid of getting on the wrong side of people. They also want to be kind. Girls are schooled to be kind and be inclusive, but they're doing that at their own expense. So so we'd love to see more mums and dads and, and, and adults generally, and frankly, men generally saying, you know, men have fair sport. Why wouldn't women have fair sport too? Why are we having to argue for this? Let's just put it back to how it used to be. We all know the difference between male and female. Let's let's not pretend that we don't. So yeah, we will keep going, won't we, Sharon? We will. We will keep going. Brilliant. Fiona. We'll keep, we'll keep it on. <laughs> Fiona, thank you very much indeed for joining us uh, tonight. Sharon is staying with us. We're also going to be talking to Caroline uh, Downey, education uh, reporter for the National Review. Uh, and that's next. How are you going to stop the votes? This is an international problem. How's that going for your party? I'm a millennial. You're a Victorian, I think. <laughs> All this helps weather people. I'm going to help the vet office. <laughs> I'm Jeremy Kyle. And I'm Nicola Thorpe. Welcome to Talk Today. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. The British fish industry has been hit by a perfect storm of problems. First, the pandemic, then Brexit, and now the economic recession. A woman can become a man, and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. David Cameron needs to worry about his own country, and frankly, he can kiss my ass. If boom, fantastic. We need a bit more of that in the UK. Well, she's she's saying what a lot of people think. Not if you can't then... call Hamas terrorists, I can't talk to you. Cut the interview. There is something to be said, though, about types of breed, that if they do no. turn, then no. you can be no. in trouble. I've got a cockapoo. No. If that cockapoo turns on me, I win the battle. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of the street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. Our only way out of the theater was through the stage. Right. Uh, so we actually had to pass right next to him, right in front of him. Mm -hmm. And at that point, he tried to get the entire crowd to chant with him, ceasefire now and free Palestine. Right. But you managed to get out, and you must have been shocked. If we had lingered for over a minute, right. I think it would have come to physical violence. You've been having to fight again for compensation after having to fight to be believed, then fight to get your conviction quashed, to get what's rightfully yours. If Archetypes was as successful as they claim, why is Spotify willing to hand that over to Liminato to do whatever they want with it? 
What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Oh! It's carry on what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> It may be that it's a more serious problem at the BBC than just her. I'm problem. giving her some objectivity because I think you Why? have to look at someone. Why are you well, doing okay. that for? This is plank of the week, Will. <laughs> bloody therapy session. <laughs> Nobody is, is spending any money. They're not prepared to do it. I mean, why is that? Uh, quite simple. The downturn in the spend is uh, three simple words, financial fair play. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? Ed Balls and, and George Osborne were asked, would you tell your kids to go into politics? And they both said no, right. because it's so nasty now, it's scary. I wouldn't, I wouldn't think they would be safe. Do not come <laughs> to the UK. All you will get is free accommodation, warmth, <laughs> food, education, yeah. health service. It's just not worth it. <laughs> That's it. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Very good morning, it's just gone six o'clock. I'm Jeremy Kyle. And I'm Nicola Thorpe. Welcome to Talk Today. Well, a very good evening to you. If you're just joining us uh, in this middle hour, we uh, uh, these days are going after a particular topic. And uh, tonight, um, we uh, are very much involved right the way through with uh, equality biological men to be allowed to take part in women's sport? Of course not. There is no equality in that whatsoever. And I'm delighted uh, that alongside Sharon Davis now is uh, Caroline Downey, education reporter for the National Review, who has taken on already many in America over such issues. Um, and, and a very good evening to you, Caroline. Thanks so much for having me. Great to be with you. Yeah, well, it, look, it's, it's good to have you with us here. And, and some of the nonsense that... You, that you've had to write about when it comes to everything from senators to people who feel that they know more about uh, sport than you do, when there is obviously, for many of them, no thought about whether there should be a level playing field or not. Right. Well, the UK is very familiar with this, but in the United States, it cannot be overstated how pervasive male invasion into the women's division of many sports from niche sports, extreme sports, strength sports, even, you know, mainstream high school basketball, just, just how serious it really is. And like you said, the adults in the room from the governing bodies, such as the NCAA or, you know, any, any of the overseeing organizations, but also the politicians, the, the congressmen, the senators, who are supposed to be calling a spade a spade and saying, this is not only unfair to women who have fought their entire lives for the right to competition that's, that is on an equal playing field, it's also dangerous and it's not safe. And we've seen this in volleyball. I covered the case of Peyton McNabb, a North Carolina high school volleyball player who suffered a concussion in addition to physical and more emotional trauma because she was pummeled in the head by a projectile spike by a male on the opposing team who she did not know was there. And then there was French Canada, French Canada, I interviewed a boxer who was set to go against a male in the ring uh, the day before she found out, not because the organization informed her, she had to find out through some informal channel that she was set to face a man with physical advantages that far exceeded her own by birth, and she didn't give her consent, so she had to pull out at the last minute. And so the wool has been pulled over women's eyes, mm. and, and they're losing titles, they're losing trophies. And, and much more. This is heartbreaking, but why is it that governing bodies, with all now the science out there, just taking, not I don't want to call it the realistic view, but the only view? Right, well, I think they're afraid of liability, but 
I think what we're seeing with just the, the gender story across the board is that liability is going to, the onset will be delayed and it's going to come from the opposite direction. There, This is producing an army of victims, women who feel like they they they've been robbed from their ac their uh, athletic opportunities have been stolen from them and and also like i said they may suffer injury the the consequences of which could haunt them for their entire lives so while all these governing bodies are trying to hedge their bets by setting testosterone limits for example for male participants they think that's the middle ground they think that's the solution but it's really a band-aid and it's a cop out because let's let's be real that will never neuter a man's physical advantages that will never change the muscle mass that they are born with that's in their very dna all it will do is you know kind of equalize the hormone levels but they, they've never really appealed to science to show that that somehow makes the playing field fair <laughs> no look you we, we completely agree with you and sharon with this i mean this is this is this is quite scary really isn't it that, uh, that uh, well i mean uh, uh, the insanity of this is let's talk, go back to the leah thomas situation again in the nc2a's because yeah. obviously that was brought up which is the college championships in america so they set leah thomas's uh, testosterone levels at 10 animals the average female doesn't even make one even an elite athlete so Leah Thomas was allowed to reduce their testosterone to 10 and still carry on. And then here, just to add salt into the wound, if a, a female athlete was caught with, you know, any form of uh, synthetic testosterone in their system, which even that brought their testosterone levels up to two or 1.1, they would receive a four year ban. Mm. If Leah Thomas was caught with more than 10, bearing in mind, there's no official testing system in place either. But should she have been caught, she would have had a wrap over the knuckles and been told to leave the sport for a year. So there, at whatever level you look at this, the unfairness is just extraordinary. It's just constant in every single possible direction. Mm -hmm. There's no way that you can square this circle. It's just not possible. You know, there are things like Q angles, which is the angle between your hip and your knees. Again, that never changes. You know, it, it, it's always the same. If you're male, it, it will be the, you know, it's what you are. The simple solution to this is to bring back sex screening. We had sex screening. In fact, I had a sex test in 1976 when I competed in the Olympics when I was 13, 100 years ago. And it's the simplest thing in the world. It's a swab to the inside of your cheek. It's once in your life because human beings cannot change their sex. Yeah. So we have a female protected category and we have an open and inclusive category where everyone is welcome to come and compete. And if that's not good enough, then the trans community need to organize their own events if that's what they want. With the help of all the governing bodies, you know, to say, how do we help you create these leagues like they're trying to do in boxing or whatever. But this is all about a fair environment for people to be able to compete. I think one of the most heartbreaking things that I had this summer, Mark, was yeah. parents ringing me up of primary school children and saying that primary schools across the whole of the UK are now having co-ed races because they don't want to get stuck like a rabbit in headlights and not a single little girl is winning a race on sports day in primary school. So what message are we giving our kids, our mm. young girls? We're telling them they're A, not worthy and B, they're not good enough. And it's horrendous. Yeah, and with that in mind uh, as well, Caroline, I, you know, I, I always hear now a lot about how, what role should a medical or psychological assessment play in determining the eligibility of the transgender athletes in women's sport. Surely we've got to be looking at the women in women's sports and worrying about their mental health. Well, yes, absolutely. I mean, to, to Sharon's point, Mark, young women school age will be deterred from entering sports altogether because of what's happening with these scandals. I mean, they they don't feel like they have a chance anymore, which is so ironic considering that feminists did make these strides after a lot of tireless effort. It's over so many decades and now it's all being re regressed. It's it's all it's all being un unwound, you know. And the other point about the medical examination is that the the problem is across these sports there is no unifying dictate saying this is how you qualify if if you are a transgender applicant th there is no like one like policy they all have different rules and so some governing bodies for certain sports all you have to do is declare that you are a different gender identity you don't have to demonstrate that you've undergone transition or have received surgeries or 
procedures, some of them don't actually have testosterone requirements either. So yeah. it's really open season across the board. And there, there needs to be some sort of, I would, I would argue, it, for the United States purposes, the Supreme yeah. Court has to weigh in. Absolutely. I mean, I think in, in, what we also don't talk about is, and you say that women have made great strides. We have, you know, we've made great strides. However, only 2% of the US sponsorship dollar in America goes to women in elite, you know, goes to women, 2%, right? The rest goes to men. Here in the UK, a 1,000 women earn their living from sport. 11,000 men earn their living from sport. So women already have this tiny piece of the cake and now we're being told we're not even entitled to fair sport. So mediocre male athletes who can't make it in, in men's sport are identifying into women's sport and taking away those tiny chances that we have mm -hmm. to actually have a platform to create a career. You know, mm -hmm. you couldn't write this stuff. I mean, honestly, if someone had told me this was going to happen 10 years ago, I would have just laughed in your face. I mean, I really would have done. Mm. What? Uh, this is sorry, Caroline. Oh no, I was just gonna say, this is this is how a lot of women at a young age develop confidence. This is how they develop a sense of self-esteem with their peers. They, you know, they learn a new skill and they master it. And it's amazing this competition to be able to practice that at a young age and to have it stripped from you because of some farce of gender inclusion, which is the new sacred cow of Western civilization, is it, it's truly dystopian. Yeah, no, exactly that. Just one final point from uh, both of you uh, here. For Caroline, uh, for you, and thank you very much indeed for joining. Are we going to get to a stage here that you're going to find at a time where you need the next generation for all sorts of reasons to embrace sport, to enjoy sport, but also if they're good at it, to believe that is a way forward for them as individuals without this worry that it could be at any stage of their development, if we don't watch it, something terrible can happen because they were up against a, a, a trans woman. Well, this is the, the scary part. And I think more cases are materializing in which a female athlete is on a team or maybe she's in a solo sport. She doesn't know she's going up against a man because maybe they've disguised it quite well or the governing body didn't bother to inform her. And so she doesn't really have adequate time to, first of all, prepare, but really respond or give her consent. And so in terms of the generational divide, I think Sharon would agree with me that there has to be the older generation of coaches, of Olympians, of athletes from whatever level intervening in this conversation and saying this is absurd these are these are young women and uh we need advocates that are adults because these these girls don't have them right now and sadly it's it's the ones they they least expected it to be, to betray them hmm. yeah i mean that caroline makes a really good point actually with the coaches mm. you know and actually with world aquatics it was the coaches association who put a lot of pressure on world aquatics to do the right thing mm. but unfortunately a lot of these sports don't have coaches associations for example track and field doesn't you know you'd have thought that one of the biggest olympic sports would have a fantastic coaches association where they could all come together and exert pressure they don't they're all very individual so we're very grateful you know to that world coaches association who work every single day with the athletes and know what the difference between a male and female performance is and was prepared to stand up for their female athletes but you know thought the governing bodies would do that that is their job and i'm just so disheartened that here we are 40 years after the whole east german debatacle and we're back to square one again where women's sport is just disposable but we will have to continue with people like yourselves to police this and make sure that they're continually found out for what they're trying to destroy. Caroline. Yes, and I do think class action suits are coming. There's plenty of litigation in the United States that's ongoing right now or, or pending concerning plaintiffs, women who say that they were not only denied equal fair competition in their sports but you know maybe they suffered other harm they suffer, suffered you know rep reputational harm or you know they were ostracized by the authorities who were supposed to be on their side defending their right to compete and so i i really think this has to end at the top uh, which i think is the supreme court and we've seen with riley Gaines, who really has been the kind of antithesis to the leah thomas she's been the spokeswoman on this issue a swimmer like like yourself 
Sharon, and uh, she's pointed out not only the biological differences that should be obvious to anyone, but apparently now need to be explained in scientific language what differentiates the sexes, but also, you know, th this is becoming, um, this is encroaching into every sport. I mean, ballet, badminton, disc golf, it's it's everywhere. Yeah. And if we, if we don't draw a line in the sand now, it will uh, have progressed too far. So, Caroline, thank you very much indeed. Sharon, just under a minute for you to sum up and know that um, people like well, us here want want to be part of this going forward and raise it at every thank opportunity. Thank you, thank you. I'm just going to read you one line here, which is from the Equality Act of 2010. S 195 is the clause. Covers all levels of sports, game and activity where one sex has a physical advantage over another. That is written in law in the UK. There is no way that any sporting body is going to lose in court if they protect a female category. And that what I, is what I find so depressing, is mm -hmm. that the law at the moment in this country does protect the ability to, to segregate and have female-only sport, and the governing bodies are choosing to protect and give the opportunity to transgender identifying men over females. Sharon Davis, Caroline Downey, thank you both very much indeed. We've got cricket, we've got Colt, and a good football story next. Want to get to grips with the stories that really matter? To cut through the spin and the BS. Want unvarnished and fiery debate? Then join us for Crosstalk. One o'clock every weekday. at eight on Talk TV. This is Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. The British fish industry has been hit by a perfect storm of problems. First, the pandemic, then Brexit, and now the economic recession. A woman can become a man, and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. David Cameron needs to worry about his own country, and frankly, he can kiss my ass. If, boom, fantastic. We need a bit more of that in the UK. Well, she's she's saying what a lot of people think. Not if you can't then... call Hamas terrorists, I can't talk to you. Cut the interview. There is something to be said, though, about types of breed, that if they do no. turn, then no. you can be no. in trouble. I've got a cockapoo. No. If that cockapoo turns on me, I win the battle. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of the street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. Our only way out of the theater was through the stage. Right. Uh, so we actually had to, to pass right next to him, right in front of him. Mm -hmm. And at that point, he tried to get the entire crowd to chant with him, ceasefire now and free Palestine. Right. But you managed to get out and you must have been shocked. If we had lingered for over a minute, right. I think it would have come to physical violence. You've been having to fight again for compensation after having to fight to be believed, then fight to get your conviction quashed, to get what's rightfully yours. If Archetypes was as successful as they claim, why is Spotify willing to hand that over to Limonada to do whatever they want with it? What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> It may be that it's a more serious problem at the BBC than just her. I'm problem. giving her some objectivity because I think you Why? to look at someone. Why are you well, going okay. that for? This is the plank of the week, Michael. Will. <laughs> bloody therapy session. <laughs> Nobody is, is spending any money. They're not prepared to do it. I mean, why is that? Uh, quite simple. The downturn in the spend is three simple words, financial fair play. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names. The New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? Ed Balls and, and George Osborne were asked, would you tell your kids to go into politics? And they both said no, no. Mm -hmm. because it's so nasty now, it's scary. I wouldn't, I wouldn't think they would be safe. 
Do not come <laughs> to the UK. All you will get is free accommodation, warmth, <laughs> food, education, yeah. health service. It's just not worth it. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. This is Talk TV. Good morning, it's just gone six o'clock. I'm Jeremy Kyle. And I'm Nicola Thorpe. Welcome to Talk Today. Look, I'm getting ready for my new primetime show on Talk TV and Radio, seven o'clock Saturday night, James Whale Unleash. I don't need you coming in here, following me around with a car. I'm so sorry about this. Saturdays at seven on Talk TV. Well, we're going to start by talking about cricket now, and uh, I'm not furious at all. I'm actually quite sad after the news that, because of complications during surgery, one of the great all-rounders, the South African Mike Proctor, died at the age of 77. 14 seasons he played for Gloucestershire. He owned, he was an all-rounder of quite brilliant uh, football, um, cricket, I should say, not football. But he was a man uh, for me that during what was such a difficult time in South Africa with uh, apartheid that he only got to play in seven test matches. All of them against Australia, ironically, and he was on the winning side in six of those and drew the other one. Um, and Angus Fraser is with us tonight. I'm hoping Neil Burns is going to be there very shortly. I think everyone will let me know when he is. But Angus is uh, here right now. Angus. Um, Mike Proctor, I mean, you know, the grainy black and white televisions in those days of Mike Proctor, uh, particularly in Gillette and other things coming, steaming in. And, and what, a, what a player and what a man. Yeah, it's a, I mean, I heard sort of there's a little WhatsApp group or Razors, it's called, which is sort of former first class cricketers and word came around uh, a couple of days ago that he wasn't well, which was disturbing. And uh, obviously the Sad news that he's passed away, came through today, and all of a sudden you there's some clips on there. Him, he took four wickets in five balls playing for Gloucestershire in a in a I don't know it was a B and H or a Gillette Cup game or something yeah. like that, and bowling round the wicket fast in swing, and it was I suppose a style of cricket that um, would be suited to now, but it was just it it just yeah he was a wonderful cricketer and a really nice fella too. I mean I. When I was playing for England as a journalist, uh, he was either head coach or involved in sort yeah. of South African setup, and and just always had time. For you. always wanted a conversation, just so welcoming, so warm, and a brilliant cricketer, and yeah. and a lovely man with it too. Ah, oh, no, no, absolutely. I I think that uh, in the way they play Test cricket at the moment, not that it quite worked out the way England do, but <laughs> I think uh, I think he would have been uh, in his element playing baseball. It would have been. We had some friends round to our house for dinner last night, and I just sort of said that he wasn't well because the conversation got to that. Mm. And one of the gentlemen there, Andy Needham, who played for Middlesex and Surrey, um, he was sort of saying, "Well, he's got to be almost one of the greatest rounders of all time," and 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 that's a big statement. I mean, Andy Needham's not someone who sort of blows smoke up um, mm. for the sake of it as such. And uh, he was just sort of saying how he was up there with the Bothams of this world, and. Or I, he, we didn't see that on an international stage because of apartheid and the fact of obviously South Africa and everything like that. But no, he was obviously a wonderful cricketer, um, bowled fast, bowled off the wrong foot. So again, a, a sort of unique way of bowling and a very, very capable batter too who used to go out there and take the game to the opposition. So yeah, I mean, not in the Gary Sobers league, but uh, not far off that certainly, yeah. which, is a, which is a huge statement. Yeah, I, I think Neil is... Uh, able to join us now and just before we just finish this uh, respect for um, the great Mike Proctor who sadly has died at the age of 77. Neil, um, 
I was mentioning they only played seven tests because of the apartheid situation in South Africa at the time, all of them against Australia, but for 14 years played for Gloucestershire. And he would have been a magnificent cricket in this modern era with his all-round ability. Well, I got the sad news yesterday from his great friend Barry Richards and the text message said, a giant has fallen and a truly great all-round cricketer but as importantly a truly great bloke in that everyone who played against him and played with him has shared some wonderful tributes over the last 24 hours about what a generous and warm person he was and um, so the the cricketing world is is hurting today yeah it it, it certainly is let us talk now about the test series that is going on it's 2-1 now to India after a third match that perhaps surprised all of us in the way that the test went at various different times and where England got themselves into the difficulties that they really did, Angus. Yeah, I, I mean, another fascinating game of cricket and it's a record defeat for England and after two days you'd have thought it would be an evenly contested game throughout so that the fact that England fell away so alarmingly and that uh, India grabbed hold of it uh, so brilliantly surprised everyone. But I suppose it's a different... I, I find it hard. I mean, Joe Root and his dismissal, you sort of... Where do you go with it? Because he was being lauded, wasn't he, last summer in the first over, first over day's play against Australia. He, he gets that shot out and he goes for six. And what a wonderful symbol of English cricket and where we're taking the game is. And I sort of sat there and you think, well, yeah, well done, but mm. it's not a percentage shot that I would sort of like to see someone playing at the start of a day's play. And then you see him play, so you see him play that shot then. So I, I almost feel that you've got a right to say, well, it was a, a dreadful decision by him to, to sort of look at playing a stroke like that. But those that were applauding it and sort of, sort of just joyfully watching the way that he did against Australia. have got no right then to be critical, I don't think, because you either play like that or you don't play like that. And I could play like that. But that was obviously the moment um, where things unravel for England, to be honest. And yeah. as your best player, you, I think you've almost got to show a little bit more responsibility than that. Do you think, I mean, it's, do you get caught up in all of this, Neil? Just... Where I agree with Angus, but... A slightly nuanced difference is that when Joe Root did that last summer, I think he was in really good form. And in this situation, he's been in poor form, not just on this tour, but he had a poor World Cup as well uh, in India. And at the start of day three, his partner was 133 not out, having played one of the most brilliant Quite test brilliant. match in England. And the key thing for me about batting and bowling in this great game is it needs to be done in partnership. And you have to be very alive to what's happening for your partner. And it might be, for example, Angus knows more about bowling than most people, but for me as a keeper, understanding bowling partnerships, you know, you might have a bowler who's normally a wicket taker, but if it's, if it's somebody else at the other end who's taking wickets, sometimes you have to pull your length back and, and actually bowl in service of your partner. And when it comes to batting, you know, sometimes you might be able to handle a bowler better than your partner, so you take most of the strike. And what disappointed me about Joe Root's decision and obviously the poor quality execution was I don't think it was in service of the needs of building that partnership. And with Ashwin not available to uh, to bowl in, in on that day's play, um, mm. and as it turned out, almost the whole of the match, we had an opportunity, if we saw off Jasper Bumrah, yeah. to get through that first hour or maybe that first session and start to build a total that was somewhere near India's 454, which I thought it was a, um, a sort of par score, really. And who knows, if we'd gone on and got a lead, India would have been under a lot of pressure in the third innings and they may have played differently, as it's turned out. Jay Swartz played a fantastic innings. But it's a lot easier to play like that when your team's got a big lead. Yeah, you make such good points as well, Neil. And Angus, was, you know, with, with all of this in mind, though, is, is it the responsibility now and again of the, the coach and the, and the captain just even, even to say to Joe Root, who's had the job, you know, 
we, we might just need something slightly different here, Joe. Or, or it, is none of that taking place, do you think? I, I, well, I, I, I don't know. I, mean, I would have thought the messages. I mean, you, you, you go. I mean, England have played brilliantly the night before. Duckett has again has played one of the most spectacular okay. test innings I've seen. I mean, it wasn't slogging. That was no. just wonderful stroke play, hitting good balls for four with with proper shots. He wasn't slogging. So, England go into that third morning, um, having grabbed the initiative from from India. Uh, with the bats, and I suppose you're looking to keep it going, sir. The message would have been to carry on as you are. Um, but it's... It, it, it wouldn't have been something he was... It, it's one of those things where you probably think about it almost as the batters, as the bowlers running up. Yeah. It's one of those things. I don't think batters um, almost sort of plan in innings. It's where the mood takes them. Yeah. And you, you make sort of decisions slightly yeah. on the spur of a moment, almost... As the bowler's running into bowl, well, I tell you what, if it's there, I might try this. Yeah. Uh, and obviously he's gone for it and he's not executed correctly. It was a good catch. But, um, I mean, Joe is a great player. He's one of great, England's greatest ever cricketers. So you, you, to sort of be critical of Joe is just for this moment in time and to sort of uh, and to sort of question his career in any shape or form would be absolutely hugely wrong. But he's made a poor decision there and it's, it's, it's proved costly. And then, uh, Neil, the second innings from... Uh, India with uh, Jaswal just again showing what a fantastic batsman he is and and you know 500 and whatever to win was always going to be difficult but you know do they have to look at one or two things there as well in um, the, the way they didn't restrict the Indian batsman in that second innings well I'm not too concerned about what happened in the second innings I and mean, i think any team that tours india is unlikely to win i mean i think the yeah. last time it was the series was in 2013. um but if you can have any chance of winning a match and certainly drawing a match you, you need to play well in your first innings and we didn't and once you get behind and particularly in the extreme heat it's asking a great deal of your seam bowlers, Mark Wood and James Anderson, and I thought, you know, did a really manful job yeah. until uh, Jaiswell really got hold of James Anderson with those three consecutive sixes. Um, but England have got to be really careful. If they keep getting bowled out cheaply, there's no time for the bowlers to rest in between innings. So it's all well and good wanting to score quickly and get a good total. But if you're getting your runs in a relatively short period of time, you're asking a lot of your bowlers, and if you're only going to pick two seamers uh, and your spinners aren't accurate enough to actually keep a, a lid on, on the game, then you're going to burn Anderson and Wood, uh, and there's still two test matches to go. So it'd be fascinating to see if Ollie Robinson does come into the mix for this game um, starting on Friday. Mm. But one of the things I would say about this particular management and all the praise that they've been given is if ever there is a captain and a coach capable of picking up their team in such a short turnaround, it's Stokes and McCullum. And let's really hope that whatever things need to be said in private, you know, get said and, and they move on and that there isn't a delusion around this is the way we play and it's the only way of playing. Mm -hmm. But hopefully people play with greater intelligence as I, well as I sort of think it's, it's exhausting really for the it's exhausting for the I mean we've got two inexperienced spinners and with uh, Bashir three inexperienced spinners playing test cricket is exhausting and you're going bang 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 sort of five games in quite a short period of time I know they've just had a few days off and they've they've been away sort of recuperating but it's just difficult to keep Certainly the starting career. I mean, that's one of the things when you get better, you get get used to these sort of things and you manage and you cope better. But mm. the start of your career to sort of be put in under such sort of um, a spotlight, which they are week after week after week, it wears you out. And therefore, it's not surprising that, that they're going to probably tire during this series and, and not be as effective towards the end. I mean, that's not good news for England, but it is an inevitable sort of consequence of what, what what's taking place in India when you're working in such a... A sort of an intense and demanding environment. Mm. I think uh, I, I'm really pleased, though, and I, I know it doesn't happen so much these days. I'm pleased it is a five test match series, though. I mean, Ranchi yeah. next Friday is, is, is a fourth test. I think 
I think this is a real marker for me, Neil, that that they still will go ahead with this sort of uh, occasion that will certainly help develop our spinners. Well, you hope that they're going to grow and develop from this. But one of the challenges that they face is that when the fifth test match concludes, these guys come back to play county cricket in March, April in England, and I can't see them actually bowling a ball. I mean, most of the overs will be bowled by seam bowlers. So it's a very tricky challenge for English administrators and coaches and captains and, and players to find a way not only to develop spinners, but to develop players who can play well on spinning pitches. And that's why I was found the decision to take the team back to Abu Dhabi and have some R&R &R for 10 days. Um, that it was quite a courageous decision by the management and they prioritised sort of mental freshness. Uh, but one or two old school cricket people might be thinking they may have been better served hmm. actually improving as cricketers playing in those conditions. But it's a, it's a decision that they've made and uh, that's the way they do things these days. And um, let's hope that either Rian Ahmed or Shah Bashir or Tom Hartley can, can come again. Yeah. What do you think, Angus? Yeah, it is a, it is a big call. And I, I, you fear at this moment in time, don't you, just because of the, 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 the way that it's gone. And, and, I mean, India, they've not sort of had uh, a trouble-free series, have they? Kohli, their best batter, has not been there. Yeah. Uh, obviously, Ashwin has, has, has missed half a test match. Uh, there's been other players that have missed some cricket. So it's not as though we're, we're playing against an absolutely full-strength Indian side. But you do worry. And, yeah, the decision to go to the UAE, uh, that that's the thing about this this setup. They just fly in the face of what you think should be doing, and um, because of the success that they've had before, obviously this match, which has been a, a pretty horrendous defeat, mm. um, you sort of well, who you, you question your own views on how you should be doing things, just because um, face of that, and they've 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 end up winning games. Yeah, they absolutely have. Uh, Neil and Angus, thank you both very much indeed for joining us. This evening, we're going to talk about a good footballing story next with Alistair, Alistair Jones, uh, hoping to hear this week about uh, a new ownership at the Hawthorns. And Jeremy Dale, PGA coach, will be with us to talk golf in the final part tonight before Had Hughes and the Unexplained here on Talk TV. How are you going to stop the votes? This is an international problem. How's that going for your party? I'm a millennial. You're a Victorian, I think. Illness helps weather people. I'm going to have the bets office. <laughs> Three, two, one. And go Browns. I'm Jeremy Kyle. And I'm Nicola Thorpe. Welcome to Talk Today. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. The British fish industry has been hit by a perfect storm of problems. First, the pandemic, then Brexit, and now the economic recession. A woman can become a man, and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. David Cameron needs to worry about his own country, and frankly, he can kiss my ass. If, boom, fantastic. We need a bit more of that in the UK. Well, she's she's saying what a lot of people think. Not if you can't then... call Hamas terrorists, I can't talk to you. Cut the interview. There is something to be said, though, about types of breed, that if they do no. turn, then no. you can be no. in trouble. I've got a cockapoo. Yeah. If that cockapoo turns on me, I win the battle. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. Our only way out of the theater was through the stage. Right. Uh, so we actually had to, to pass right next to him, right in front of him. Mm -hmm. And at that point, he tried to get the entire crowd to chant with him, ceasefire now and free Palestine. Right. But you managed to get out and you must have been shocked. If we had lingered for over a minute, right. I think it would have come to physical violence. 
Ben, you've been having to fight again for compensation after having to fight to be believed, then fight to get your conviction quashed, to get what's rightfully yours. If Archetypes was as successful as they claim, why is Spotify willing to hand that over to Limonado to do whatever they want with it? What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, this is. <laughs> It may be that it's a more serious problem at the BBC than just her. I'm problem. giving it some objectivity because I think you've got to look at someone. What are you well, going okay. up for? This is the plank of the week, Michael. Will. <laughs> bloody therapy session. <laughs> Nobody is, is spending any money. They're not prepared to do it. I mean, why is that? Uh, quite simple. The downturn in the spend is three simple words, financial fair play. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names. The New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? Ed Balls and, and George Osborne were asked, would you tell your kids to go into politics? And they both said no, no. Mm -hmm. because it's so nasty now. It's scary. I wouldn't, I wouldn't think they would be safe. Do not come <laughs> to the UK. All you will get is free accommodation, warmth, <laughs> food, education, yeah. health service. It's just not worth it. <laughs> That's it. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Weeknights at 8 on Talk TV. A very good evening to you. Uh, if you're just joining us tonight, uh, we've had some fantastic guests and uh, talked about some really important subjects. And, of course, uh, we will have back in, of the stands podcast tomorrow where you will be able to get all the highlights uh, on uh, wherever you choose to get your podcast from so uh, look out for that and on Wednesday we uh, have our second podcast of the week where we take a topic each week and look at it in detail and men in women's sport trans men of course is the subject and we've uh, had a fascinating hour if you've missed that and uh, we'll uh, get all of that across to you on uh, back of the stand our new podcast here and uh, you can get back of the stand from wherever you get all of your normal podcasts, of course. Well, we're going to talk about a really good news story now. Uh, it's a story that we have followed for some time here. In fact, as long as Talk TV and uh, the Sunday Nightclub, I think, has been in existence over the last couple of years or so, is that uh, what on earth was ever going to happen to West Bromwich Albion Hawthorns with owners that had little regard for anything but themselves? And hopefully, during the next few days, a Florida-based father and son consortium will become the new owners of West Bromwich Albion. And um, delighted to say that Alistair Jones, Action for Albion, uh, is joining us right now. Uh, good evening to you once again, uh, uh, Alistair. And, uh, well, this is... It, well, it, it looks good news. Well, it's better than good news. I was like a kid Christmas morning on, on <laughs> Friday morning, Thursday night. It was just a, a surreal atmosphere. Yes, obviously... We lost the game against Southampton, who played well on the night. Um, but as I say to many people, we lost that battle, but we've won the war. And um, it's a fantastic thing that we've got. It's just a, a relief is the first <laughs> instance of feeling, really. It's just a weight lifted off our shoulders. One of the committee men, Matt, said, even my voice sounded different. It's just like a complete relief. And everything that we had has just sort of been weight the weight has been lifted off all of our shoulders as you can see some of the clips that we've we're very proud of that we did in march last year we did loads of stuff but the most important thing we did was we stayed peaceful and above board and we had real good dialogue with the club because they recognized that we're trying to do it in the right way it was all no swearing peaceful legal above board and and that took us to a lot of places we never expected to be so yeah we're we're very proud of what we've achieved and who knows 
what difference we made. I think most people would suggest that we've helped expedite the issue. That and our yeah. friends at the not that it's an eighty eight percent or eighty seven point eight percent take over. The other twelve point two are still held by uh, minority shareholders, which are represented by shareholders for Albion, and, and we've dovetailed with shareholders for Albion, and their chair Lee Kent has done an incredible job long before our inception, and they've been protecting our football club from the likes of Mr. Lai mm -hmm. um, consistently since 2016 when Jeremy P sold us down the river. Um, so, yeah, it's just a culmination of a lot of hard work from a lot of people. Uh, as I say, shareholders for Albion go underneath the radar a lot, but their, their work mm. uh, uh, and their diligent work has been incredible, really. So, yeah, it's been a, a fantastic weekend, apart from... 8 o'clock kick-off on Saturday, <laughs> but we'll move on from that. We don't really want to talk about that today because it's a good news story, but, yeah, it's... Um, such a, as you can see by the footage of the thousands of people, I think we ex we had 5,000 people last March coming yeah. to do it March. We expected a few hundred, and, and the police were shocked. We had to start it early because there was that many people going to it. But it just shows what a little bit of um, organisation and a little bit of feeling and passion gets you. As I say, we are, we're very proud that we've done it in the right way. Yeah. And, and we've always... And, and can I take the opportunity to thank you and your producers for everything that you've done and given us the platform on talk tv um to be able to to talk about this consistently and as i say our work and hopefully is now complete but we want to make a difference still with mm. the football pyramid we're still passionate about the football pyramid and we don't want anybody else and any other football club to go through what we've been through yes we've got a little bit of a good news story but we can also mm look at what we've done in the past and what we've learnt from and you can just look at some of the pitfalls that Albion have fallen into and hopefully help other clubs from falling into this precipice that we very nearly did. Yeah, well, look, uh, Alistair, you speak so well and um, uh, on behalf of all of us here at Talk TV, we're, we're glad that the, the story's finished in the way that we all hoped it would and and to keep uh, to keep all clubs like yourselves who've gone through rogue owners ownership uh, in the past, I mean, eight years if you think about it, eight years it was in the end. I had air. You, I'm sorry? I had air then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, these are important and I, and I hope from this and, and you know, the, the smooth um, change now through to the father and son uh, based in Florida obviously and, and what they're going to do is um, where the Football League can now understand what is needed for other clubs and what is needed to be uh, done. And it's not just down to the reaction of the fans. We, you know, they have got to really start to look into detail at some of these rogues that want to come in and destroy football clubs, pretending that they actually want them to succeed. Absolutely. Uh, and again... We, we've worked, uh, and I can sort of reveal things now, we, we, we spoke to the EFL and we had meetings with the EFL as, as a group uh, that Andy Street, the mayor, put together for us. So the, these are the sort of things that we can sort of help with other football clubs that hope well, that, that it's going to happen, unfortunately. It's just uh, yeah. a nature of the beast. The EFL, unfair, in fairness, I've been very critical of them, but they were pretty under-resourced, but I can only speak as a find, and I can, I can tell you that the... They were very, very helpful with us, sort of straight uh, and honest with us. And they were very quick to respond. So credit where credit's due. We were very quick to jump up and criticise. But if uh, yep. it's only fair when they've done something that was good to say that as well. Um, Nicola Richards, our MP uh, for West Bromwich East, has been instrumental in the campaign as well. And all, all I'd say with regards to people that are going to get in this situation, just look, there's more than one way to skin a cat. We get that... The, the, the militant thing is the most obvious thing to do, but sometimes if you think a little bit differently and think outside the box, you can get a lot of it a lot, a lot further. And uh, uh, Reading have been a, a testament, and obviously every club's different, and I completely understand and sympathise with the reasons why Reading went down that road. Yeah. We felt our decision wasn't that far down. It's because we we weren't in as huge amount of danger, but we weren't far away. So all, all that we'd say is that. Every club, every club is different, but every club is special to those people involved. And if we can help in any way to stop and, this happening from yeah. anybody else. The, the other thing, Alistair, of course, that, that, that those of us that are invo have always been involved in, in one club throughout our, our lives, not, not our careers as such, but is that it's, it's all of the unspoken people within 
um, your West Midlands area and the, and the black country, those that are perhaps are the taxi firm that, that has, you know, had a, a contract, the, the caterers, the people that, that paint or repaint parts and the builders and everybody else, all, they're all nearly forgotten about that, that, a, that the, a football club going under can really dramatically change even further some of these deprived areas. Absolutely, and this is one of the things that we learned, to be honest with you, because it was new for us. We're all volunteers at the end of the day, and one of our first um, initiatives was possibly to stop kiosks and programmes, and then you step back and you think about it from, Lee mm. taught me this, a helicopter view, where you think, well, hang on, if we stop the programme, we're going to actually stop the livelihood of the people that, draw, that print the programme. So we're not hurting mr lie we're actually hurting the local community so there's lots of different things that you have to weigh up and pros and cons and that's where our committee came in we've got a, a committee that we've had from 11 strong um uh, throughout the whole process that i'll be honest with you the one that one with with me was uh, the second the number two if you like paul faulkner we <laughs> argue like uh, brother and brother two brothers really and <laughs> i think everyone else gets really fed up with it but you need that yin and yang yep. sort of thing to be able to get successful but mr patel is a fantastic looks like addition for albion he looks like a perfect fit for the demographic of the region as well we've yep. obviously got a very diverse community in the west midlands and it's fantastic that we've got somebody of indian heritage that is invested in the football club and will see us hopefully to e embrace that community even further. We've got some really good things with Apner Albion and, and some Albion supporters groups, but that's something that we can grow. We've always been at the forefront of change and social change at West Brom, obviously with the three degrees and things like that. And we, we're very proud of that heritage and we want to continue that. And I think the, having the links with Mr Patel and moving that forward, that's something that we can thrive on. He's also looking at the history. Obviously, it's only been a few days, but you, you, you Google, don't you? And he's done a lot of things. You've done a lot of things he's done a lot of things in Tampa with his local community and he looks very philanthropic and he wants to be a major part of the community so we're hoping that he embraces that we were very pleased that he called himself a custodian of the club yeah. because he's not the owner the owner of the institution is us that's who owns the football club the custodians will come and go and hopefully Mr Patel will be a, a real success and and yeah we're looking forward to a celebration party at Wembley in May at the prior final that's what we're hoping for it'll be a good end to the story well you know that that has been the thing though hasn't it that's been so important here that the commitment from the staff the playing staff and the management to to continue I mean I, I know of others that perhaps elsewhere might have thought what's the point Absolutely, and, and I think that's another thing that we, that we tried to do was try to separate the two entities. Of the the only issue we had was with the ownership. We haven't got any issues with the football club. There's some great people that work at the football club, both on and off the pitch. Carlos and the team, have, for the first time in a long time, we've got a bond for the team, and we really back that team. Yes, we lost on Friday, but you can never fault the effort of that of our squad. And Carlos Corbera, and I'll tell you now, we won't realise the importance of him until five or ten years in the future because when he came, mm. we were destitute, really. We were at the bottom of the league and the more, more likely to go into League One than the Premier League. The job he's done, he's done is just remarkable. Mm. And there's lots of people, Ron Gourlay has moved on, but yeah. the, 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 the MSD loan has actually protected this football club more than anybody could ever realise. And um, then latterly, Mark Miles stepped into the breach at the time of crisis as an operations director. He stepped up to the plate as being a very committed member of West Bromwich Albion and he's had 20 years service and he's probably, and I'm, I'm not being rude, probably he, he put into a position that he didn't ex ever expect to be and he's performed and got this deal over the line. The communications director, everything's been a really good and it, obviously it's a good news story that we've finished uh, and I think that yeah. a lot of people have put their oh, they're all into it. I'm knackered. You deserve to be knackered as well. Of course, you're on the road for the next week, aren't you, Plymouth? And then I, I guess yeah. uh, I saw it's an early kickoff against at Hull. Hull. Yeah. That'll be on the that'll be on Sky, won't it? Yeah. Well, yeah. My son and I are getting a nice early pick up out in Sedgley in the West Midlands at half past six. <laughs> <laughs> on Friday, on Saturday morning, so he said. He said my son said actually, he said, I thought it was a three o'clock kickoff. I thought, bloody hell, <laughs> there'd have been some states on that coach if it was a three o'clock kickoff. It's fortunately it's half past twelve, but yeah, it's. Um, we're looking forward 
the most important thing now is what everybody wants to do is concentrate on the pitch. Yeah. And I do jokingly say, I can't wait to moan about our fullbacks again. It's going yeah. to be great rather than having to moan about the the financial situation. It's it's just a, a positive news story. And as I say, I just wanted to come on. Thank you for the opportunity. No, well, thank- you personally, for, uh, you, it's not just the show. You've supported it throughout Twitter as well and, yeah. your, and your production staff, Parag and um, Chris have been fantastic. So... We really appreciate everything you've done for us, honestly, and you've made a massive contribution to hopefully our success story. Well, so thank and, you. And that's the great thing is that hopefully next time we talk, it will be, you know, we win the final game of the season and we're in the playoffs or we're that's in right. this or whatever. I mean, this is this is the great thing about this is that it means that all of us generationally now, we, you all can at West Brom and think, you know what, we can just think about West Brom and the football and have all that excitement to come and the ups right. and downs where the hope kills you but <laughs> it doesn't destroy the club. Exactly. We've got we've got kids for a quid, for instance. Um, so our, our season tickets for under 15s are, are a pound, twenty four pounds or twenty three pounds. So there's lots of things. But my dad, um, my dad took me. I take my son. My sons will be taking my grandchildren, and that's what we're fighting for. And it sounds corny, and it sounds all that, but it's true. We've had a generational thing. I was talking to Matt again, one of our committee members, and he was saying when the news came through, we was thinking of people that are no longer here. And there's lots of Albion fans that have contacted us that have said that we've gone away. We, we've got no delusions of grandeur. We, we oh. know that we can only do so much. But what we've done, I think, is united the fan base. And as one, we've stood up and said, our football club is too important for you to just pitter away. And we're not having it. And unfortunately, the club understood. And as I say, to get together, Ian Skidmore, the the communications director, says this saying: "You've got to be in the ring to fight the ball," and he's absolutely <laughs> right. And we've taken that and learned that from from that from from yeah. Ian. And it's, uh, yeah, it's just a really good news. I'm just very relieved. I'm going to go and have me a, a couple of points and just have a think about what we've done and those clips and keep watching and and remembering about and um, um, what a special time it was. And yeah. as I said, made some lifelong friends from doing this. So that's a really good thing to do. Well, you know, the West Bromwich Albion's uh, motto from the town is absolutely appropriate. Labour conquers all things, work conquers all. And you've done an incredible amount of work and you deserve all of you uh, to enjoy the future now, the baggies. Thank you. Thanks for joining thank us, you. Alistair. Thanks Brilliant. Much, cheers. No, thank cheers. you very much indeed. That's uh, Alistair Jones. And of course, if your club, and there are many clubs still in trouble, you can get in touch with uh, Poreg and Chris and, and us here at Talk TV. And uh, we are very much part of wanting to give everybody a voice uh, within the game and not just at the very highest level. We're going to talk golf because the golf season is really getting the, 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 the Californian swing, the genesis in uh, LA at the moment, all sorts of other bits and pieces. And delighted to say that Jeremy Dale will be joining us next here on the Sunday Night Club on Talk TV. How are you going to stop the votes? This is an international problem. How's that going for your party? I'm a millennial. You're a Victorian, I think. <laughs> illness helps weather people. I'm going to help the vet's office. <laughs> I'm Jeremy Kyle. And I'm Nicola Thorpe. Welcome to Talk Today. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. The British fish industry has been hit by a perfect storm of problems. First, the pandemic, then Brexit, and now the economic recession. A woman can become a man, and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. David Cameron needs to worry about his own country, and frankly, he can kiss my ass. If boom, fantastic. We need a bit more of that in the UK. Well, she's saying what a lot of people think. Not if you can't then... call Hamas terrorists, I can't talk to you. Cut the interview. There is something to be said, though, about types of breed, that if they do no. turn, then no. you can be no. in trouble. I've got a cockapoo. Yeah. If that cockapoo turns on me, I win the battle. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of the street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. 
our only way out of the theater was through the stage. Right. Uh, so we actually had to, to pass right next to him, right in front of him. Mm -hmm. And at that point, he tried to get the entire crowd to chant with him, cease fire now and free Palestine. Right. But you managed to get out and you must have been shocked. If we had lingered for over a minute, right. I think it would have come to, it would have come to physical violence. You've been having to fight again for compensation after having to fight to be believed, then fight to get your conviction quashed, to get what's rightfully yours. If Archetypes was as successful as they claim, why is Spotify willing to hand that over to Limonada to do whatever they want with it? What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> It may be that it's a more serious problem at the BBC than just her. I'm problem. giving her some objectivity because I think you Why? to look at someone. Why are you well, doing okay. that for? This is plank of the week, Will. <laughs> bloody therapy session. <laughs> Nobody is, is spending any money. They're not prepared to do it. I mean, why is that? Uh, quite simple. The downturn in the spend is three simple words, financial fair play. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? Ed Balls and, and George Osborne were asked, would you tell your kids to go into politics? And they both said no, no. Mm -hmm. because it's so nasty now, it's scary. I wouldn't, I wouldn't think they would be safe. Do not account yeah. for the UK. All you will get is free accommodation, warmth, <laughs> food, education, yeah. health service. It's just not worth it. <laughs> That's it. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Very good morning, it's just gone six o'clock. I'm Jeremy Kyle. And I'm Nicola Thorpe. Welcome to Talk Today. Well, a very good evening to you. We're going to round the first show off tonight. It's been a terrific show from start to finish uh, and uh, some great guests. And you can follow it all uh, on uh, Back of the Stand, our podcast, uh, which uh, is a new venture for us here on the Sunday Night Club on Talk TV and wherever you get your podcast from, it'll be there. Uh, Monday and then a second one on Wednesday as we looked at, uh, in detail at uh, how women's sport must be kept for women at all levels and not trans women trying to continue to gate crash the party and some terrific guests we had on tonight if you've missed that you won't want to miss um, when uh, the podcast comes out on Wednesday morning uh, let's talk golf now and um, the Genesis Open of course uh, a favourite of uh, many uh, is uh, still continuing at the moment. We haven't uh, quite got uh, to the finish of that, obviously, in California, uh, eight hours behind us. But uh, plenty to talk about uh, with that. And Tiger Woods, who's feeling a little better today after flu was diagnosed for him at the uh, halfway stage. And uh, the Genesis Invitational, he's very much part of the whole event, not just playing and it, it was good to see him back again this season too. Jeremy Dale is a PGA coach and a top man as well and it's good to see you uh, Jeremy. Um, a, an awful lot to talk about I mean sort of week in week out without people saying too much the, the, the seasons have got underway with their different swings around the world and here we now are now wondering how all of this is going to link up together with live with what's happening on the PGA and, of course, the DP? Uh, well, it's interesting times. Uh, we, we don't know anything more. Incidentally, thank you for having me back. Last time we spoke about this, um, and nothing was really resolved, and we're, we're still there. So nobody really knows how that's, uh, how that's all going to unfold. Um, the, uh, uh, the PGA Tour have new investors, uh, and, yeah, they're looking at alternatives. Uh, we thought the buying of John Rahm would, would serve to bring the PGA Tour to the table, which it has. Um, and we're still in a, in a, in a, in a state of, of flux. We don't really know. There's sort of dubious messages from, from Tiger coming out 
Um, and as you mentioned in the introduction, he's he's looking like he uh, is coming to the end of his career, and it would be a nice thing for him to do. He's a staunch defender of the PGA Tour. Um, it's where he's made his his name, his fortune as well. Uh, it's been a great stage for him, and it is a great stage. I mean, we're, we're going to talk about two different tournaments. You couldn't be more different uh, than the Phoenix Open and the, and the, the storied uh, LA Open, sponsored by Genesis now, of course. Yeah. Um, both uh, tournaments with with great histories, um, but uh, yeah, where the tour goes, I, I I don't think we know anything really more about that than. Uh, but it will be a great watch. It'll be very interesting. Yeah, no, it, it will be. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of talk as well about various other bits and pieces at the start of uh, the, the the season, really. And the Phoenix Open has been very much in focus. I mean, it is. Um, a bit of a playground. It's uh, sort of the, the the par three with, with with everything that happens there, and and the beer and the the wine and the the slightly uh, um, nizzled heads by uh, mid afternoon in many cases. And people wondering whether I mean Americans, whether you meet them in the states around the the pool bar or whatever, they are loud, aren't they? For to start with, they they get very loud. But um, fueled by the the drink, have they got too loud? Is this, is this going over the top for what is still now supposed to be, uh, you know, a serious event? Well, I'd be the last one to call time on a party, uh, and that's what the 16th hole has become. Yeah. Uh, they've got grandstands. It's like a football ground. They've got grandstands all the way yeah. around it. Uh, and if that works, that's fantastic. And uh, on the Saturday of the tournament, uh, the organisers, in their uh, own words, lost lost control a little bit. The quote I loved the best was the, from the improbably named Chance Cosby, who is uh, um, chairman of uh, the Thunderbirds. Now, everybody thinks that uh, the PGA Tour has control over the tournaments, but actually each individual tournament has only as a promoter, and the tour supply the scoring systems, the players, and all the PR and, and all, the, all the rest of what they do. But they don't actually own the tournament. So the Thunderbirds, charitable organization of local businesses, this fella said, yes, we, uh, we got it wrong. Uh, you'll see operational changes, and the kicker was nothing was off the table. Well, oh. that was probably true, wasn't it? There was yeah. <laughs> everything was on the table: beers, everything you wanted. Uh, and they, um, what they got, I think, was uh, into a, a bit of a muddle. Yeah, yeah. On that Saturday, there was a rain today. Uh, the ground conditions were terrible. People were slipping down slopes, uh, and they uh, they had this charge. They opened the gates at dusk, and people yeah. run to find yeah. one of the two, 200,000 seats at the at the 16th hole. Uh, and they start drinking there and then. They open the bars at dawn. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they wonder why um, things go wrong. And uh, there were play delays as well on that Saturday. And also, I, I, I saw on, on Twitter, there was a bartender that was giving an interview. He said, literally, the, the play, the, there were so many people outside the gates. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and once you create this atmosphere, um, then you get the non-golfing fans as well, which kind of... Is, is, is the debating point, really. Do we want that, or, or do we want to just make it a uh, golf? And do we have confidence in the golf, or do we want to invite everybody because we want to grow the game mm. um, and appeal to a younger audience and all of that? And, and some of that smacks of desperation. Anyway, what they what they did was they, they let the doors open, and then the stewards on the, on the gates got fed up with it and let everybody in. Yeah. Uh, and the hospitality bars ended up letting everybody in. Uh, and there were some amazing stats. They had 1.1 million beers sold. In a day, <laughs> they, they had 54 arrests. They had 211. I've got this all written down. Uh, 211 people uh, ejected. They had fans fighting. They had the uh, the stars in the bunkers. The, the, that that the pitch invade uh, had yeah. did. Um, they had um, Zach Johnson and and, uh, and and Billy Horschel confronting players, uh, confronting spectators rather. Yeah. Uh, and you have spectators then trying to sort of almost influence what's happening. Um, which is not not a, not a good look, but it'd be hard to judge the whole tournament on just one day. It's given us some great moments. Tiger's hole in one, um, yeah. way back in 1997. Uh, Sam Ryder had a hole in one, and that beer shower um, maybe was just on the on the, on the, on the kind of limit. But um, uh, it would be hard to to say yes. What a terrible tournament! They must never do that again uh, on, because it actually has been the biggest um, the biggest attended. Uh, tournament in, in in the tour for, for years, five out of seven times in the year. It was uh, for the last seven years. It's been tournament of the year. So I think it's a great, I think it's a great event. I like what they're trying to do, but this time it just got out of control. And I think that's more circumstantial. And and what you'll see maybe is more of a limited uh, attendance and limited bar sales next year. 
after, uh, other than that, I don't think they necessarily have to do uh, that much. And you're right, there's an American attitude that the fans feel that they have almost ownership of the right to do whatever they like. It's yeah. like Twitter, you can go on, say whatever you like, and there won't yeah. be any consequences. And that attitude bodes really badly for the Ryder Cup, which is going to be in New York, which uh, is not known for its um, quiet reserve types, really. <laughs> The, f the first time I ever went to uh, Flushing Meadow, I mean, I, I, I couldn't believe people sort of ordering hot dogs from, from the, the main courts and shouting as they do at yeah. baseball and everything else, no, you know. It's, it's but it's part different. of... There, see, I'm with you on this as well, because um, for one week in the year, uh, I, I, I think that, you know, that they the players are excited to be part of it, as long as it doesn't in any shape get... In, so involved that somebody gets injured or uh, somebody gets hurt, particularly players and uh, and other things because of this. Um, and uh, and I think I, I'm sure they'll find a way. And I I think it's early enough in the season as well um, for it to, to to continue. And and I hope they do. I really do. Well, it's a good week. I mean, we're in February, aren't we? I mean, yeah. you know, it's there's 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 a good. It's a great spot for it because it's not in the mainstream. It's the lead up to uh, the the, uh, the players championship and the masters, yeah. uh, and it, and then they they go to to the Genesis this year uh, this uh, this week rather on a which is a completely different sort of event, more of a garden party, a very very you know well known ex exclusive club where you we really have to uh, have to behave. Um, so they they know they they know they got it wrong. Uh, it would be really hard to. To sort of to write the whole tournament off. It's got great history, as I said earlier. I mean, Hogan won it twice, Arnold Palmer won it three times, mm -hmm. Barrett Nelson won it a couple of times. It started in the 1930s, and it's got great uh, uh, it's got great history. So, and also a great finish. I mean, there was some golf played as well. Yeah. Um, and well done to Nick Taylor from Canada, who birdied the last three holes, got himself in the playoff, birdied the first playoff hole, uh, and Charlie Hoffman again, great story later on in his, in his career, 47. Yeah. He birdied it as well, and and uh, and uh, and Nick Taylor birdied the, uh, the second extra playoff hole. So there was some great golf, and the sa the Sunday was was much better. Oh, it was much better weather as well, uh, so we didn't have the um, uh, the topless the topless large people sliding down slopes and and you know the crowd egging them on, and then there was there was you know, there's incredible stuff on on Twitter, people fighting. Uh, there was also a lady that fell out of grandstand as well. Yeah. Um, hopefully she's okay. I think she is. Uh, but stuff like that just can't can't happen. Um, and one of the interesting things is, I think with with golf, um, why is this different? Why is golf different? People might ask to football or rugby or whatever. When the crowd can mm. get involved and say what they like, and you know you can shout during a during a football match, and it won't put the player off at all. Um, and there's a difference, I think. What psychologists call it: open skills and closed skills. So open skills you can think of as uh, reaction mm. skills, which happen in open play. A closed skill would be like a rugby player mm. kicking a penalty, uh, a footballer taking a penalty as well, a golf shot or a serve in tennis. Now, in all of those, um, without having it being explained, the crowd naturally knows that, that they can put, thing, put, put the player off. So generally, you'll get quiet. Uh, at mm. Wimbledon, you'll get quiet. You'll get, you know, I was at Twickenham for the Wales game. Uh, the other week, and you get respect the kicker on the big screens, and people generally do. Um, and in these sports, it matters a lot that the player isn't distracted by a sudden sound or scream, or, or by some uh, somebody in the in the crowd trying to put them off. So it does matter. The crowd behaviour really is important, uh, and uh, this idea that the crowds can can be part of the action and, and get away with that. Um, needs to be stamped out, I think. Um, you, you mentioned Tiger Woods. Uh, I think we'll 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 get get you back. We've got plenty of golf to come uh, and talk more about where he goes next and how difficult it must always be to decide when, not perhaps just you want to retire, but the game doesn't want you to retire. Well, golfers get the luxury of deciding when they go, and they can scale things down, which Tiger's done. I mean, he hasn't actually completed a four-round tournament. Uh, for, for ages. Uh, he, he made the cut in the Masters, then withdrew. That was the only time that he did that uh, last year. And he's, he's trying to play one tournament a year, uh, sorry, a, uh, a month. Um, and, you know, he, he actually can't, he'll find it difficult to walk for four rounds, especially at Augusta or places like that. So he's naturally um, scaling back. It must be quite a trial to get your game ready and also physically complete the tournament. Uh, and I'm not surprised. I mean, he's, he's now... 
um, taking a bigger a, a bigger role in in the PGA Tour, and he's just launched that uh, that brand, uh, Sunday Red. Um, so, I mean, Tiger can do whatever he likes, yeah. really, play when he wants, and 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 quit when he wants, and and nobody will will think the worst of him for that. I'm sure. Uh, Jeremy, great to talk to you. We'll speak again very soon. Uh, Jeremy Dale, uh, that's been the programme. Great team uh, with me here. Uh, Howard Hughes, follow that. I, I don't think I can, Mark. How are you keeping? I'm very well, actually. Yeah, very well indeed. Well, I hope I'm going to be able to keep you entertained for the next two hours. Oh, then I'm, on in your the way home, I'm in the car. Okay, I'm in the car because well, there are good. no trains running anywhere. Oh, well. I think you're in the right place and you're in the perfect place to listen to the show. Now, tonight, uh, we're going to ask the question, is Russia really developing a super-secret space anti-satellite weapon? We have to worry if they are. We'll talk around that with uh, defence expert Mike Yardley. Pilots and UFOs, Gary Heseltine will be on. And we'll get the latest on a great big sunspot and what it means potentially for us. Professor Jurek Vink at Armai Observatory will be on. Um, sadly tonight, we're not going to be able to talk about nuclear fusion. Uh, the guest that we had booked for that, unfortunately, has had to drop out in the last hour. So we'll try and do it next week. Uh, J.M. DeBord will be on on communicating with people through their dreams. Uh -huh. uh, Jason Gleaves will talk about UAP images. There's a lot of UFO stuff on tonight. Um, to Philip Mantle on some new Pascagoula abduction materials, some new sound files that he's got. After 50 years, they're still discovering stuff. And um, author researcher Glenn Steckling, whose family have been involved in the work of controversial ufologist George Adamski for decades, we could almost say for generations. So we're going to tell Adamski's story and also get to know Glenn Steckling after 11 o'clock tonight. There is, like the old TV Times, and I know I've said that like a stuck record, but like the old TV Times, there is so much in it, Mark. Well, there so absolutely is, and uh, I'll look forward to it uh, as well.